names of uh, <laughs> her, her name has escaped my hmm? she has a microphone aha hmm? uh -huh, chemtai miss chemtai you are most welcome hmm? what i know about her she's an international person who travels to present papers hmm? She even came to my office some time back requesting for permission to travel, and I thought she was kidding. Hmm? I'm also an investigator, so when I did some digging around, I discovered she's not a simple person. Hmm? So, Ms. Chemtai, you're most welcome and thank you. I know you will not disappoint. Hmm? Now, I think some of you, or most of you, have got um, a copy of uh, today's program. We are hoping to conclude this activity by 1 p.m. Today is a Friday, a lot goes on, so we don't intend to keep people here longer than they should be. But uh, I hope this will be a fruitful engagement. The topic at hand is very critical, especially in these times of um, COVID-19, political turbulence, media freedoms, freedoms of Ugandans generally. Mm. Though I know some of this could be overshadowed by international events, mm, such as Russia and Ukraine. Mm. The world keeps evolving. Before it was climate change, then came COVID, and now we have. Mm. So someone can think COVID left, isn't it? Or that climate change is no longer a threat, but these are things that... Um, coexist with each other and we have to learn how to live with, with them. So at this point, I would like to close my welcoming remarks by saying that um, to our panelists, these are our students from um, year one to year four, and this is just a percentage of them. We could not get everyone in this hall for COVID regulation compliance purposes. That's why we try to scatter the seats so that we don't endanger people as they are here. So thank you very much everyone for being here and our panelists for taking time off to, to come here and our moderator. And uh, UCU is a very hospitable place and uh, all of you, it's good to hear you're not new to UCU. And we hope we'll continue working with each other even in the future. Thank you very much. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? Say hello to your neighbor. Find out what their name is. You know. <laughs> you know. You know, I have moderated so many events and I've held so many discussions that people get to sit with their neighbors and they don't even know who they are. So tell your neighbor your name, which, which, um, which, which year are you in, you know, what is their hardest course unit, you know. <laughs> While I was doing my, uh, my, my master's, media law was one, one of my hardest course units, having to, you know, be a lawyer uh, at one, sec one point. I'm very serious about this. I'm going to be looking out for you to tell me your neighbor's name. Sir, what is the name of your neighbor? Yes. Huh? Elizabeth who? <laughs> All right. Good morning and welcome to this session today. We are really excited to be here. We are discussing... Um, you know, this conversation will be um, literally covering the right to freedom of expression and assembly. And we are questioning, are we moving forward or are we moving backwards? And we're really happy and a special thank you to UCU, to the American Bar Association, 
as well as the East African Network of University Law Clinics for making this happen. My name is Solomon Serwanja, and I am the Executive Director of the African Institute for Investigative Journalism. Dr. Peter Mutesa Serdino, Faculty of Law, you will allow me to make you a panel because I cannot skip you in this conversation, clearly. <laughs> so, whilst you gave us the keynote address, I think I'll be able to engage you. The documentary that you watched earlier, and we can leave a copy for all the students to, um, to pick one of them. Um, if you have a memory stick, you can get to Viola, and you can get to watch it and internalize it more, was documenting the chilling tales and narratives of journalists who covered the most recent elections, especially those that were covering the opposition. We all remember those gruesome images on our screens and in our social media, um, WhatsApps and Twitter and Facebook of what happened to the journalists who were beaten, battered, and some of them broken. I just heard this morning that Ashraf Kassirie has gotten asylum out of the country this morning while I was coming. Um, some of the journalists who we spoke to said that they don't want to cover elections again, at least not covering elections, uh, uh, you know, covering the opposition at that. Certainly, if you speak to any civil society organization that is in the space of freedom of expression and democracy and good governance, they will tell you that the civic space is shrinking. The fact that we cannot express ourselves in a way we feel is very terrible for us as a country. I recently made a comment on Uganda's decision to abstain from voting at the UN General Assembly on the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Dr. Mtesa said, I can tell you, I put out a tweet and I said that Uganda's decision to keep quiet in this issue was a clear indication that it was siding with the oppressor and that Uganda will face the consequences of its decision. So what I wanted to say is that I was attacked online. One of the government's, government people came out and said, who are you to say these things? Which capacity do you even speak in? And I was telling her, I am a citizen and I'm entitled to my opinion. And so, they are what they call keyboard warriors and government has es established a whole organized body of people to fight back on people's views online. But that's not to say that um, the digital spaces have actually given us an opportunity for us to speak out and freely what we think in the way we are governed and in the way, you know, we express ourselves, that's our right. And the laws in Uganda give us that right to express ourselves. But perhaps before I come to say anything, I would like to invite the dean to give us a keynote address that is going to be founding us today in our conversation. And the dean is going to be speaking to the impact of COVID-19 on the right to freedom of expression and assembly in Uganda. Dr. Peter Mutesa Asira, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Um, Mine is going to be all-encompassing, but of course not escaping the fact that uh, we are still in the COVID-19 era. But as most of you know, Um, <laughs> thank you, Andrew. I was saying that we cannot escape the fact that we are still in the COVID-19 era. And as you're well aware that uh, the world is still grappling with COVID-19, leave alone the current ch challenge at uh, the time, 
that is spreading to the rest of the globe, that is the Russia-Ukraine war. But COVID-19 still exists. It has wrecked havoc, wrecked economies, wrecked lives, wrecked livelihoods. Um, people rendered jobless. Other people have been uh, left with permanent health damage, lungs, respiratory system, other body organs. But um, COVID-19 has also been used as a shield and a sword by especially governments to curtail on freedoms such as that of expression and assembly. You know the time COVID struck, the court had just um, nullified some provisions of the Public Order Management Act, and then COVID struck, and then, as some people say, the government was back in business. So they needed not to quote POMA, not to quote other laws to impose restrictions on the freedom of expression and association. Of course, with COVID-19 came imposition of uh, COVID-19 control measures, just like it was done all over the world to curtail the spread of the disease. For instance, in Uganda, we had lockdowns, we had curfew, we had uh, border closures, we had restrictions on movement, ban of public gatherings. So this greatly affected the enjoyment of the right to freedom of expression and association and of course, this right and these rights and freedoms are very important when it comes to identifying states that are really democratic and their state of governance. So the freedom of expression and association is provided for in international instruments and regional instruments, such as the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention Against Discrimination of Women, the African Charter, the list goes on. In the Ugandan context, we have the Constitution, Article 29, freedom of the media, freedom of association, assembly, the right to demonstrate uh, functioning of political parties, NGOs, and these categories of groups are mentioning have all faced the brunt of um, experiencing the full force of the state under the guise of implementing COVID control measures. The press, you've seen what happened to them, beaten left, right, and center. Those who want to demonstrate, you remember Stella Nyanzi and her people who went downtown to protest high prices of commodities during COVID, how they were dealt with. I don't think Mr. Seruhaja here was part of the people who once tried to protest against social media attacks. Mm? But I remember, I think it was Raymond and someone else mm? yeah. who faced the fire. But I think Raymond fled, because even Bobby Wine fled. I don't know who was arrested. Mm? Mm? So during the COVID period, we've also had an election. Mm? And freedom of expression and assembly also provides for activities of political parties. You have seen journalists saying political party activities and elections are now a no-go area, especially those who opted to follow a particular candidate. They got the beatings, <laughs> the beatings of their lives, mm? and some are still nursing wounds up to now. Mm? So, in my opinion, whereas these COVID-19 control measures were well intended, mm? but to some extent they were abused, misused, they were disproportionate, some were not even necessary, as they were curtailing the right to freedom of expression and assembly of the Ugandan citizens. It is suggested that any limitation imposed on the right to freedom of expression and assembly should not exceed what is legally accepted and justifiable. And this is provided for under Article 43 of the Constitution, provided for in international instruments such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Any limitation should be legally accepted and justifiable and reasonable. 
So one would then ask, were these COVID-19 control measures legal, reasonable, and justified? We used to see people dying to get permits, to get permission to move to hospitals. Someone is on deathbed, but is lining up at an RDC's office to get. And I'm told some people are even being charged money, about 5,000. And sometimes the RDCs would even say, you don't look sick, go back home. But the freedom of movement is constitutionally guaranteed, but here it was being curtailed by restrictions in the form of COVID-19, control measures, restricting movement. You saw people being beaten. Before you even explain why you're moving, you're being, you're being beaten. The press, even the press sometimes, there was a time some people were coming from a talk show, I think from NBS, and they were arrested. Simply because hmm, one, one of them said controversial things, actually two of them. Hmm, but then they were arrested for defying curfew. curfew hmm, but later it turned out the reason they were picked up was because, hmm, and this was saying that the government was using COVID-19 control measures as a shield and to deal with you, that you're going to spread, you're going to spread COVID. You saw people <clears throat> who tried to gather, mm, being dispersed, mm. whether in public or, or private. There's a time they were even showing LDUs breaking into people's homes to enforce curfew. Mm. And the president had to come out and tell these people to go slow. Mm. People are losing their lives. Mm. You're not asking why someone is moving. Maybe they are going to a health center. Maybe they are going to pick up drugs. We saw people who suffer from TB, HIV, AIDS, they're the biggest victims. Before you're asked whether you're going to pick your drugs, you're first beaten. But people had freedom of movement, but here they were being restricted by, by COVID-19 control measures. Now, whereas it is important to control the spread of pandemics such as COVID-19, this should not be used as an excuse to disfigure and unnecessarily restrict freedoms and rights such as that of expression and assembly. These rights should be enjoyed by all citizens without discrimination. I think during COVID you saw some people were moving freely and others were being arrested. Some media houses, people were being massaged, others were seriously being, especially these reporters who are working for these online platforms. Is it Mm, Choto, then what else? Mm, Ghetto TV. Mm, they are being beaten to pow and arrested. Mm, and even some, some Ugandans who are covering for international media houses, they are really being roughed up. Mm. So, even in times such as those of COVID-19, where states are permitted to impose restrictions and limitations on rights and freedom such as that of expression and assembly, this should serve the basic purpose of controlling spread of the disease and no other reason, such as curtailing these rights. For instance, we have what we call the Syracusa principles. They are basically public health principles that apply around the world. These are soft law instruments, but they also under Article 25, for instance, permit a country to impose restrictions in times of health emergencies. But in Uganda, it seemed like COVID-19 restrictions were beyond handling a health emergency. You saw it even during elections. People are being arrested for violating COVID-19. Some people were arrested in Kalangala that they had gone to spread COVID-19. Others were arrested in um, Luka, is it Luka? that they had gone to spread COVID-19. But the Constitution clearly under Article 43 puts in place parameters that uh, a state should apply or operate within when imposing limitations on rights and freedoms such as that of expression and assembly. The Ugandan courts have also pronounced themselves when it comes to 
legally justifiable limitations, for instance, on freedom of expression, in the case of Charles Onyango Bo and Andrew Mwenda versus Attorney General, where the Supreme Court stated that any limitations on freedom of expression should be acceptable and demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic. So did the state try to justify limitations on freedom of expression and assembly brought about by COVID-19? For instance, the Constitution provides for the right to demonstrate but what were your chances if you tried to demonstrate, say, in March 2020? Or in June 2021, what were your chances? Wouldn't it be like signing a death warrant? Hmm? <laughs> or imagine your parents called you. I'm told some of you stayed around hostels around that time, and you told them, ah, we are going to demonstrate. Hmm? Or during uh, 2021 general election period. December 2020, early January 2021, and you told them you are following a certain candidate around dressed in red, what would your parents think? Hmm? That you're tired of life, isn't it? But should this be the case? Hmm? And in most cases, when police were swinging into action, the excuse was spread off. People arrested for not having masks, hmm? and then they end up in the court martial. <laughs> mm? And then 40 people are found with a bullet. Mm? <laughs> so these are all things that happen in this country. Mm? So issues of proportionality, issues of necessity, issues of these limitations being justifiable should always be at the forefront of any limitations imposed on the freedom of expression and assembly. When the governments operate within these limitations, it will basically prevent those in authority, especially the law enforcers, from abusing the rights of the citizens. Undoubtedly, as stated earlier, the COVID-19 restrictions have adversely affected the freedom of assembly, especially the right to demonstrate. Could you demonstrate during lockdown? For whatever reason, even if you are disgruntled, could you? How about during curfew? Hmm? Could you do that? Hmm? Borders are closed. Maybe you are caught up in Rwanda or Congo. Would you return? Though we saw some people returning on chartered flights. Hmm? But how many of you here can chart an aeroplane? Hmm? Even a toy aeroplane. Hmm? Hmm? But someone is chartering a Boeing to return people, hmm? ban on public gatherings. Hmm? And this ban on public gatherings even extended beyond the lockdown into the election period. Hmm? And the election was deemed to be a virtual election, but was it virtual? Hmm? People were holding rallies, people were moving around while others were being arrested. Hmm? Secondly, the COVID-19 restrictions also adversely affected freedom of expression, specifically referring to the media. Gagging of the media continued and in some cases intensified. Some people were even arrested for spreading fake COVID news. There's a journalist who said um, someone had been given fake COVID results and this journalist was arrested. Another one was arrested for, actually went into hiding. He interviewed a lady who was in quarantine and she narrated her suffering. And this man, the government was hunting for him. He's now an MP. So probably now can't be picked. And as you know, media provides the much needed information and news during times of restrictions. But remember, most of them were even laid off because of COVID. So, these restrictions also affected the right of access to information as guaranteed by Article 41 of the Constitution. Information is very key in times of pandemics and information is key when it comes to exercise of freedom such as that of expression and assembly. For instance, if you have no information, what can you protest over? Hmm? 
unless you're the kind of person who just follows people around and asks what is going on later. Hmm? Without information, the media would be useless to society. Hmm? But during this period, hmm, limited information was going around, and surprisingly, even the media now concentrated on giving COVID information other than information about other things that were going on in the country. Probably you don't blame them. COVID is what was. But there was still no medicine in health centers. The roads were still bad. Commodity prices were going up. People couldn't afford masks. Things have now come down. But I think at the beginning of COVID, a litre of sanitizer was about 150,000. Isn't it? The price of soap went up. National Water refused to give us free water. Hmm? These are things the, the media could have been reporting about, but they are now also, and you don't blame them, focused on COVID reporting. And most of this was press conferences and presidential addresses. More like take it or leave it, isn't it? Hmm? I think a strip of vitamin C was like 10,000 for 10 tablets. Hmm? And as they were saying during that time, if you were poor, you were surely going to die. Hmm? And of course, with access to information, the internet plays a very critical part. Mm -hmm. Internet in this country remains the, the cost remains the highest in the region. Mm -hmm. Living alone countries like Congo and Sudan. But where Uganda is now, the internet should be cheaper than it is. And those of you who are studying online, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. At the time, we still also had OTT. Mm -hmm. So this was also a barrier to accessing information. Lastly, COVID restrictions also affected the freedom of movement. Freedom of movement is very critical when it comes to expression and assembly. If you can't move, you can't express yourself. If you can't move, you cannot assemble. So, things like lockdowns, things like quarantine, I had a story, but I don't know if it is true, that some people, if they wanted to restrict your movement, they would label you as a contact of COVID and forcefully lock you up in a certain place, saying that you, <laughs> saying that you have COVID or you're going to spread, even if you had gone to campaign. Uh -huh. Mr. Nanga would say, you are arrested because you are intentionally spreading COVID or you had an intention to spread. Hmm? But shockingly, those who were arrested were never tested for COVID. <laughs> hmm? But they would say you've gone to spread. And of course, even journalists were not spared. Hmm? You had the IGP saying journalists have to be stopped from moving to certain places for their own. And if need be, they have to be beaten. So if you're a journalist and you can't move, of what use are you to society? Unless you're going to be like this uh, information minister during Saddam Hussein's time. Hmm? What was his name? Hmm? Chemical Ali. Hmm? Even when Baghdad was falling, he was like, I'm just from a cabinet meeting, all is well. Hmm? We've killed 10,000 Americans. Hmm? And I'm told he was even arrested. Actually, he surrendered himself to the Americans and they told him, you have no use to us. Hmm? You are just talking with no action. So, Things like requiring movement permits, all these were results of COVID-19 restrictions. And they definitely adversely affected the freedom of, of movement. But uh, keeping in mind that even with COVID restrictions, we had the Public Order Management Act, we had the Computer Misuse Act, but COVID was now a bigger sword in the quest to limit and impose restrictions on, on the right to freedom of expression and assembly. At that time, there was no need to quote POMA, there was no need to quote Computer Misuse Act, because COVID was a silver bullet that would fix, that would fix everything. Of course, now you're also hearing the amendments to the Public Health Act, spitting, I hear refusing to get vaccinated, all sorts of strange things. I thought people had to make informed choices. So, 
In conclusion, COVID-19 control measures adopted by the government of Uganda undoubtedly adversely affected the enjoyment of basic human rights, such as the right to freedom of expression and assembly, especially the media movement, right of movement, and even those who intended to demonstrate or protest. This was very risky business. Whereas the government could be commended for bringing COVID-19 under control, but in my opinion, some of the measures adopted were disproportionate, were unacceptable, were not justifiable, and could not even be. Why would someone lose their life because you're imposing COVID-19 restrictions? You're saving me from dying by killing me. You saw border border men who would bypass roadblocks being shot. There was even a lady, there was a WhatsApp doing rounds. I think she was going to hospital or something, and then a policeman whipped her on the back. Of course, the borderman escaped and she fell and rolled seriously. People couldn't go to hospital. You saw women who died in labor in their homes because the husbands couldn't secure, couldn't secure permits. Journalists are being beaten because they are covering events where COVID is spreading. <laughs> and they are being beaten to pulp for their own safety. So going forward, the government should not impose arbitrary limitations on freedom of expression and assembly through generalized references and use of words such as acts likely to endanger the health of the public. So even during this time, by the way, the president said that those who assemble and even distribute food would be charged for attempted. And if you're in doubt, go and ask the MP for Mitiana municipality. Hmm? <laughs> Trouble follows him around. Even yesterday, poor man, he was, hmm? a mob was descending on him. Hmm? But there are other people from other political factions who are issuing food and nothing was being, hmm? was being done. Hmm? So government, in a bid to enhance the right to freedom of expression and assembly, government should enhance access to information. Did you notice that most information being given out during COVID time was in English? Hmm? And by the way, does it shock you that even up to now, the constitution hasn't been translated and people are now in court for things such as translation? Hmm? And by the way, once you don't avail information, then people circulate their own misinformation and fake. Hmm? When you don't give information, you create a vacuum. And this fake information or misinformation can actually trigger what governments have been avoiding, such as demonstrations that become protests. Mm -hmm. Of course, the internet is a powerful tool to realizing the right to freedom of expression and assembly, and the government should remove all barriers and limitations on the internet. In some countries, in some parts of this country, there is no internet. Even in the city center, it is slow. OTT was scrapped, but then the taxes were. So before you could avoid OTT, but now with scrapping of TT, OTT, you can't escape the increased taxes on the internet. And most of you come to my office crying over internet. Even the dean has no internet. <laughs> Some people think I move with bandwidth in my pockets. I don't have. So the media should be protected. Its independence should be guaranteed. Hmm? It's really saddening to hear stories we've had. Hmm? When celebrated journalists are saying, even if Jesus returns, I am never going to cover any, any elections. This is not worth dying for. Hmm? But we shouldn't get to that. The media is an important ally in realizing the freedom of expression and assembly. Of course, the government should also hold accountable criminally and administratively, all its officials, especially security forces, who violate the rights of the citizens. Hmm? Mr. Seranja here will tell us how many police and army officers have been successfully prosecuted for violating the rights not only of Ugandans, but especially their very own. You are beaten in Kololo, I hear you settled with the CDF. Hmm? 
you are beaten I hear where you are even the gentleman who was beaten is it Akena hmm? the one who was kneeling and being beaten I hear he also settled hmm? the soldiers who beat up the women who are selling mangoes in Chiseka market were also but probably someone needs to go to jail or something of the sort hmm? to know that something is being done hmm? but you saw even someone was in a hospital bed being interviewed hmm? people have died body parts being maimed people incapacitated, hmm? all because of um, COVID-19 control measures. Up to now, the shootings of last year, November, was it last year? No, 2020. Hmm? The numbers of people that died are still being contested, but up to now, I don't know who has been tried for those atrocities. Hmm? So in conclusion, whereas COVID-19 control measures are necessary, as was adopted in very many states to curb the spread of COVID-19. These measures should not curtail, but rather preserve the rights to freedom of expression and assembly. And these rights should still be tenable and protected even in times of pandemics. Because like it or not, we are in the new normal. COVID isn't going anywhere soon, right? But if you're curtailing freedom of movement, political party activities, activities of civil society, uh, activities of the media, hmm, th then it means Uganda is avoiding moving into the new normal. Hmm? So that is, that is all from me. Thank you very much for listening to me. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause to Dr. Peter Mutesa here. <laughs> Dr. Peter, I am really, really um, fascinated by the examples that you used. You remember everything like it was yesterday. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just wanted to get a general reaction on uh, the keynote address from the panelists. I think I can start with Dr. Livingstone Sewanyana. You've been closely listening in to the keynote address by uh, Dr. Peter Mtesa Sira. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it uh, before we can get deeper into the discussion. Your general thoughts on his presentation. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Solomon. Uh, morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here at the invitation of the Faculty of Love UCU. And of course, listening to the great presentation from uh, Dr. Mtesasila, I definitely agree to a large extent that he has given us a broad overview of this particular right and how it is enjoyed. But before I do that, let me say I came, uh, Solomon, with a colleague, uh, Doris, from the university. Nelson Mandela University of South Africa and I'm always delighted to hear about the American Bar Association. I have had an opportunity to address the American Bar Association in New York and I admire the great work you are doing in the area of promoting rule of law and human rights. Thank you for the support and the partnership you are having with the CEO. Now to this topic as the current United Nations independent expert on promoting a democratic and equitable international order, I am charged with one task. That is examining state practice and understanding the, the way states apply theory and how they take measures to ensure respect and enjoyment of human rights and democracy. Within that framework, I'm required to be as objective as possible. Of course, looking at Uganda's experience over the last 20, year, uh, 20 years or two years 
in particular, no one would disagree with the doctor that we are facing a democratic backlash. In fact, to understand whether we are enjoying the right to freedom of expression, association, and assembly, all we are experiencing a decline, you need to go back in history. I recall my good friends here, if we go back to the 1990s, some of you might have been very young. In the 1990s, there is a certain degree of freedom that we really enjoyed. You recall we had Vimezas, where people discussed freely. You could criticize freely. You could even criticize the president. But there has been a steady erosion of that freedom, more particularly in the last five years. However, we need to take note that the right freedom of expression, association, and assembly are not absolute rights. They are rights that are subject to restrictions. However, the restrictions, as ably put by Dr. Tessasila, must be proportionate, must be necessary, and must be legitimate. So the question we need to ask here, looking back two, three years ago, does state practice actually augur so well with the normative framework in place? Dr. has ably taken us through the regulatory framework, both at the domestic level and also in terms of international law. But one thing is clear. Whereas at the theoretical level, there seems to be a clear understanding and agreement that these rights we are discussing matter, the practice varies. There tends to be selective application and certainly they seem in many instances to be inconsistent with Article 43. Article 43 allows the state to depart. It allows the state, as long as that departure does not amount to political persecution. In most of the situations where you see these rights being violated, there seems to be a clear pattern leading to political persecution. Let's take, for example, the most recent one, just this morning. Commissioner Zake has been pushed out of the parliamentary commission because he allegedly authored a tweet. But he has not been accorded a fair hearing, which is, of course, inconsistent with the principles of natural justice. When you talk about the issue of Kakwenza, Bukiraba Saija, having also uh, made comments against the first son and the president, you will agree with me that the manner in which he was treated is disproportionate to the act itself. So the challenge that we face in Uganda is how do we ensure a delicate balance in the application of the law? We are very quick to condemn, but we need to be careful that for you to have an objective analysis, you need to understand what the international law parameters are. Talking about COVID-19, definitely, as doctor has put it, we saw a lot of violations taking place. But what is the missing link? International law is very clear. 
it says if you want to depart from the enjoyment of any of these rights other than the non-derogable rights because under article 44 the constitution spells out very clearly what are non-derogable rights like right to fair trial a right to habeas corpus and the like you must deposit an instrument with the secretary general of the united nations so having declared uh, COVID, having issued the directives as the president did, there was a missing link. Government of Uganda did not deposit an instrument with the Secretary General of the United Nations to the effect that they intended to depart from the enjoyment of some of these rights. And that was a big mistake. Because whatever restrictions, whatever violations, whatever abuses took place, they were deemed to be inconsistent with our international opposition as well as the legal framework obtaining in Uganda today. And that should be a lesson. For countries that are democratic, they definitely had to initiate such an instrument to say, look, these rights will definitely be subject to some restrictions. But when you don't do that, then you are expected to ensure respect for the enjoyment in their full totality according to the law. The, challenge, the other challenge that we are facing in respect to the enjoyment of the right, freedom of expression, and association is the whole question of executive disdain. Executive disdain in itself is a behavior of the state that tends to create a chilling effect on the population to the extent that they can no longer demand. And that also goes hand in hand with political intolerance. Some of these violations can be attributed to executive disdain and the other to political intolerance. Ugandans generally at the moment do not feel strong enough to demand any of these rights that we are talking about. To the extent that when you demand, you are seen to be out of the normal. So when my brother Mwine or my brother uh, Solomon makes a demand that the media should be free, the question that therefore arises to many people is generally we seem to see them enjoying relative freedom. There seems to be a liberalization of the media. The media in Uganda seems to have a great latitude to operate. Why do they claim that they don't have the space? That can be attributed largely to the lack of knowledge and also to the issue of executive disdain. That now we experience the effects of a repressive apparatus that does not create a liberal mind in order to make demands on the state. And as such, most of these violations go unpunished to the extent that increasingly they are becoming the order of the day. Which is then Just one last thing, Solomon. I always ask one question. If you knew you were right and you met a police officer and he beat you up and you said, oh, you have no right to beat me, would that stop him from beating you in Uganda? If you answer that either in the affirmative or in the negative, that speaks volumes about the current 
state of affairs. Finally, I would just say that yes, the rights rhetorically and at normative level do exist. However, they are subject to a range of threats, largely restrictive legislation, executive disdain, and political malaise. Thank you. Wow. Interesting. Thank you very much, Dr. Livingstone. It's quite an, an, an interesting one. Uh, ben, you are in this media space. And what we're seeing is a shrinking space for expression. We have had media houses now getting very worried to make some statements, host some people. Um, we know that there are some stories that the media is not comfortable talking about it, not because they don't have the stories, but they're actually worried that what happens if we put out this content. I have been in different media houses where you have a live feed coming in from the field showing the military beating people and the producer says hold it up it, it's ready you just need to punch it in and they have to think twice about won't you CC switch me off or will won't I get a call from the minister that I'm trying to portray government so there's heavy censorship and in the way it shrinks the space it now becomes difficult for you to host some vocal people anyway I'm out of the space. You are in the space. I wanted you to speak to the freedom of expression in the media, uh, generally as you comment uh, and react to the keynote address by Dr. Mtetasi. Um, thank you very much, Solomon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's an absolute delight to be with you and uh, an honor for me to be on such a distinguished panel uh, with international travelers and, and, uh, and uh, doctors and, and professors. Um, so, again, uh, I'll start from where Dr. Sewanyana pointed off the fact that in the 1990s, when I think maybe half of this room was not yet born, we didn't have these sort of discussions. Uh, the Bimeza, which actually ended up becoming the reason why the freedom of expression is being threatened, was because I mean, you could say literally anything that you wanted. And the problem was that maybe that wasn't such a good thing. Um, when I was thinking about this lecture today and what we're talking about, I couldn't help but think about the bigger picture and the fact that, I mean, we are, this is Uganda Christian University, so you can't run away from the fact that we uh, give attributes to, to God and the Bible. In the book of Romans 12, uh, Romans 2, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about people being a law unto themselves. And he says that even though they didn't know God, they were a law unto themselves, that even their thoughts excused them, some accused, sometimes excused them. And I think that we've got to keep that at the back of our mind with every single discussion that you have, because like both Dr. Mtesasida and Dr. Sanyana said, everything else becomes theoretical and can just become English. If you look at it, strictly speaking, the, the African Charter for Human Rights says that we have the right to freedom of expression, but it adds three words within the law, right? The problem with that is that you then ask, what law? What is the law? Article 29 says that I have the right, okay, to express myself, and it specifically alludes to media, because when you think about freedom of expression, media is at the center of it. What we are doing here is media. Now, here is the problem. You then have things like the POMA Act. You then have the Computer Misuse Act. You then have the Anti-Pornography Act. Right? Where if two of you went and did bad manners and filmed it, and it somehow ended up on my phone and I sent it to Dr. Sewanyana, I'm the one who gets arrested. Does that violate a right? What does that mean? And the point I'm trying to make is this, that while we are told that we have to do 
what we do within the law. We are seeing very clearly that laws can be created, and Dr. Mtesa put it up very well with COVID. You cannot go and say that I stopped Solomon from going to a certain place because he was supporting FDC or DP or NUP. Because legally, as a one in anger, I will come and tell you we were enforcing COVID regulations. Can you dispute that anywhere? No. Legally speaking, he can prove that we had restrictions in place for your own benefit. Like Dr. Tessa said, we will kill you <laughs> to protect you from dying and do it legally. Can we please remember that we've been in, it's not more than 25, 30 years ago that we had a law in South Africa that said that you, Solomon, cannot marry a Mzungu. Okay? And it was a law. In a court where you, if you married a white person, you could get sent to prison. And so I think that the way our freedom of expression, um, association and assembly is managed, and again, the big theme that we're talking about is the question that we're asking today is, are we moving forwards or backwards? It's obvious that we're moving backwards. But the reason for me is because we keep hiding behind English on either side, and it doesn't take us anywhere. Because the government will come up with a law to restrict your rights. You will become more vocal because you think you have rights. I saw a tweet a couple of weeks ago from a very renowned lawyer who was in a verbal fight. Uh, he's, he's become a very famous lawyer. I think he's called a rebel something, rebel lawyer or something. And I thought to myself, I cringed, okay? Because I thought to myself, this is someone who, for all intents and purposes, because of his brilliance, could end up becoming a judge or a chief judge at some point in the future. But this is someone now who, because of his right to freedom of expression, is saying some very interesting things to someone else. I, I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to repeat them here. Right? I hope, uh, Dr. Mtesa said, uh, uh, do I have freedom of expression to say? <laughs> See, my rights are being curtailed. <laughs> Let me try and phrase it in English that might not be offensive. This person was telling someone else on Twitter in public to go and do something to themselves. Right? To do something to certain parts of their anatomy. Let me put it that way. Okay, some people have got it. The word starts with F. Um, and I thought to myself, this is exercising your right to freedom of expression. But is it useful for the greater good? Where do you draw the balance? There's something that um, Dr. Mtesa Sera pointed out that I think, again, is very pertinent for us, especially as a country, when you think about it. As a democracy, we're not the oldest in the world. We have challenges that are very clear. As a society, we have problems that emanate from our culture and things like that and how we work. We are a very tribal country, and you cannot dis divorce that from this discussion, right? So, Dr. Tessasa mentioned something to do with the distinction between demonstration and protest. How many people in this room can clearly define the line between a demonstration and a protest? Because one of the challenges we've had from where I stand, is that many times in Uganda, you have a protest that is being put off as a demonstration. So when the police pulls their gas, they're saying we're fighting a protest. In some cases, they are right, because there's, there'll be provocation. I'll never forget 2009, when I almost got killed during the Kayunga riots. Uh, again, I think most of you guys were probably very young. You don't remember. You were probably in school uh, at the time. 
But what basically happened is that a very small thing escalated very quickly and became a big problem where Kampala was on fire. And there was a thing that then happened where we are being told, Tambra and Gombugandu. Now, I'm a Munyankole from Kashari. My Uganda at best is very sketchy. So I'm in Makerere and these protesters now, because this was no longer a demonstration, it was clearly a protest, are banging cars, breaking windows, doing all of these things. And I happen to be in that mix. So they come up to the car, they were being chased by the police. And they ask me, where did that chief? Now please, again, refer to my Uganda, at best is very sketchy. So I tried to think of the first thing that I could think of, right, quickly. And I said, Mandaz. <laughs> True story. So you can imagine what happened after that. The only thing that saved me from lynching was the fact that the police were so close to these guys that they then had to run away from the tear gas. So when you juxtapose that against, again, the bigger picture, I liked what Dr. Sawanyana said about there having to be a balance. In my opinion, that balance has got to be at a point where, as a society, as a community, you stop hiding behind the law and English and things like that and agree on things that are acceptable or unacceptable. I'll finish with this example. Again, the freedom of expression says I can say anything I want. And yet that's what caused a million people to lose their lives in Rwanda in 1994. Because a bunch of priests went onto the radio and said, I don't know if you guys know the famous phrase, terminate the cockroaches. That's what was said. And one thing led to another. And in a very short period of time, a million people had lost their lives. Many of whom were just now being, it was bandwagon. Uh, I don't like Solomon. That guy refused to give me sugar when we were in school. Let's get him. Using the excuse of, because someone has sort of stirred a reaction. So again, for me, we need to be thinking about where we are as a society in our hearts, beyond laws, because laws will be made. Solomon, we can make a law that says that the way you're sitting is illegal. <laughs> and we will put you in prison and there's nothing you can do about it. But I think that we have to think, and I liked what Dr. Tessa said, said about that in terms of, and he mentioned it as well, you call it political what? Malaise, where we must start thinking big picture. And the reason why this is important for me is because when I'm looking at this room, my assumption is that the average age here is maybe 20, 21, 22, right? How many people are older than 25 in this room? Exactly. The reason why that's important is because you, as the legal minds of the future, have the ability to turn around our country. It's not going to be done by writing laws. It's going to be done by the way you think as an individual. Because when you are in the office that Dr. Tessasera is in, or Solomon is in, or I am in, what you do will not be based on necessarily what the law says because you can use and abuse that as you please. It will be based on what you as a person think and want to do for the greater good. And I think that both these gentlemen raised these points very, very clearly, and I think that should be the big picture if we want to sort of stem the, the damage that is being done at the moment to what's happening. Ben, thank you. Can we give Ben some love? <laughs> ben goes to spaces that we don't want to go, but he takes us there anyway. <laughs> ben, I think Dr. Mtesa Sida has quoted the Onyango Bo and Andrew Mwenda versus the Attorney General, and he said in his presentation that the Supreme Court noted 
that the constitutional limitation on the freedom of expression should be acceptable and demonstrably justifiable, quite so many words, in a free and democratic society. And you're saying that beyond the law, we need to set societal, you know, lines that you can't go across. And yet what we've seen in the recent past are people who think that they have a right to speak up and say whatever they want to say and express themselves. I mean, the Kakwenza, I hosted a Twitter space uh, talking about, you know, Kakwenza and the torture thing. And one person said, okay, beyond the torture, I mean, all of us are against the torture. But beyond the torture, whilst he was exercising his freedom to express himself, how did he do that? Did he overstep his mandate and his freedom to freely speak out by you going beyond what society perhaps may not consider justifiable? And I think similar conversations have happened on Stella Nyanzi case and, and, and several other cases and, and that's why you are trying to tell us that, you know what, over and above our freedoms, we must have societal limits that, okay, can you say it better? You know, can you put it better, express yourself better? If, but, Solomon, if, if you just give me uh, 20 seconds to say this. If I stood here and abused your mother, how would you feel? Terrible. What would you do if I used very colorful words to describe your mother? <laughs> If I called your mother a prostitute. <laughs> Many of us would fight back. And that's the whole point. But the problem is not even that. It's what happens after that. Because what happened with Kakwenza all of a sudden is you've got this thing, which then sets a precedent and makes it difficult for anyone else now to express themselves because of what's happened. And I think that's where that, you know. Thin line comes in. I hear you. Uh, let, let's advance this conversation by uh, talking to Chem Tai. I have here a keynote address that was um, that that uh, that was uh, developed by UCU, and I just wanted to read it verbatim and perhaps to ground you. And it goes on to say that whilst this okay, so it quotes how students in different universities have been trying to express themselves, and it says that. It is important to note that in higher institutions of learning, the right to assembly and, and freedom of expression has continuously been curtailed, especially where students have, for example, mobilized to, to put out their views on student welfare and on issues that concern them. And, and, and it goes on to give an example that on 8th of February 2020, 10 students were arrested and suspended from Makere University for protesting against continued use of online lectures. In 2016, two Uganda Christian University students were expelled over missing results, over protests on tuition hikes. At the International University in Uganda, police deployed to quell a protest by students over missing results on 14th of February 2020. And it continues to say Chambugu University students have been involved in protests over missing, missing you know, marks and they were all arrested and some others expelled. Freedom of expression and assembly in the space that is occupied by students and universities. Do you feel you are curtailed by the dean for you to speak up on these issues? <laughs> you have your freedom to speak, so you're going to speak out today, right? <laughs> and you have a student who is going to be speaking on your behalf. Chemta, you want to come in? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chemta Sindia. I'm in my fourth year of law school. And I happen to be so privileged this morning to share this uh, panel with very important people. I feel so big already. So my friends, don't associate with me. I'm not small. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, so um, 
I'm speaking for the students. So, Mr. Dean, don't take it against me. Yeah, I still want to graduate, you guys. <laughs> I've seen the tent, so don't shake it for me. But I'm going to speak from um, a honest point of view. Uh, as we all know, the freedom of expression and assembly are key. They're provided for under the Constitution. The speakers have ably uh, expounded on that. They've spoken about it. They've done all they could, and we shall still keep talking about it. Article 29, Article 20, uh, 29, 1D, freedom of assembly. Um, but we've seen it in the society, how all those are being violated. We've seen people being beaten for assembling. We've seen people being arrested for expressing their views. So how does it work when it comes to the students, when it comes to the university? He said, we have the mandate to change, um, Mr. Ben, the mandate to change the situation. It's up to us as upcoming lawyers to change the status quo. But it starts from right here at the university. Are you giving us the platform to express ourselves, Mr. Dean? Are you giving us the platform to carry banners and move around the university protesting the delay of our marks? Are you giving us the platform? <laughs> Don't overclap, I'm scared. <laughs> no, Mr. Dean is cool, as you all know him, the coolest dean in Uganda. So, um, <laughs> so when we see Makere students being arrested for complaining about online studies, you know, we are going back to the new normal. We are resuming. Uh, physical studies, and we've all experienced the burden of studying online. It has not been pretty. Many people will confess that one of that terrible semester's performances were those ones that we had online. And the law is just not like any other course that you go and, you know, chill for a whole semester, do exams and pass. It's so practical. We need resources in the library. We need to sit there and spend nights and, you know, read and read and read. And some of these resources, especially Ugandan resources, are not online. You know, so if students come up and complain, it's not that they're not enjoying the chilling at home and all these things. It's because they're concerned about their future. They're concerned about the breed that will be made to graduate. So if you deny them the right to tell you that, what you're doing is not good, then you're giving them the, let's say, the platform to view it. I mean, we shall not change it up there. We can't change it right now. Yeah, we have no chances of changing anything out there if you can't give us the platform or show us how to do it when we are still on ground. You're literally grooming people that will grow up and go out there knowing that we are restricted. We are not supposed to talk about this and this and this. You know, you're scaring us. So, the protests, um, I'm so much inspired by the UCU students that stood out and went ahead and protested after they were suspended. It's a prominent constitutional case now. Every first year law student must do it. Yeah? So, that laid a foundation and say that students have a voice. You can't say, oh, this is a private university, you're going to chase us and suspend us and we're going to go back home and go back to our parents. No, they defied the odds, they faced the consequences and they were rewarded at the end of it all, you know? They went, they graduated, they're out there working. So I think that's the kind of example that we should emulate. And I'm also urging the the administrators of the different universities, be it Makere University, uh, UCU, uh, Chambogo, these are the futures of tomorrow, uh, the, the, the leaders of tomorrow that you're grooming. It's just not anyone else. So if you restrict them, if you scare them, you're, you're, you're killing the change that you're expecting to see. Give them a platform, uh, correct them if they're overdoing it, you know, you called it restrictions out there. When we've grown, we shall understand that uh, 
Article 43 restricts the extent to which we enjoy these rights. So when they're overdoing it, calm them down and talk to them. Do not beat them up. Yeah? So allow them to express themselves and show them which extent is allowed. So students, on your behalf, I hope I've represented you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Chemtai, thank you. Mr. Dean, I would love you to speak to some of these things. Uh, freedom of expression for the students, universities and tertiary institutions too have laws. Uh, whilst we're discussing it at national level, uh, but universities too have laws and rules and regulations that they expect students to follow. And every time students speak up and stand up against some of the excesses, uh, like she has said, many of them are dismissed. And she asked, Mr. Dean, do you give us the platform to express ourselves? And people clapped. So I'll give you a mic to answer. Um, <clears throat> thank you, moderator. I didn't know the tables were going to turn on me. <laughs> but at least uh, for those who have approached my office, it's um, things turn out to be better than expected. Though there are times where people come with <laughs> problems that can't be solved. But I try to solve problems. So looking at it from uh, university lenses, yeah. um, it is not in doubt that universities are nursery beds of national politics. And even those who will become national leaders in future, you see them now. And even now as a student, chances are the, the classmates and friends you have here are the people who are going to influence your way of life for even the next 10 years. After school, it is a bit hard to get genuine friends. Most of the friends you'll get either want your legal services, want your money, want your connections, or want your demonstrating skills hmm, to be rubbed on them. But um, speaking to what has been said, in UCU we believe a lot in dialogue. And I suspect in other universities, hmm, in Buganda where I come from, they say the big bird teaches the younger ones how to fly. So as dean of law, if I'm always <laughs> demonstrating and protesting, in front of the VC's office, probably you'll also pick up on that and see if the dean can protest, then who am I? But uh, it is a constitutionally guaranteed right, and I believe usually this should be a last option after everything else has failed. But someone has not even met you before, they come to your office and they, as the dean, and they want to exercise their right to freedom of expression by undressing. Dean, you don't help me graduate, you're going to see the worst. Hmm? Hmm? And I'm like, what is your name? I don't even know you. Hmm? So we should do our part. Before you get to a situation where you have to demonstrate or assemble to engage in something, did you do exams? Did you do coursework? Did you pass? Hmm? Are you living by the university rules and regulations? But even then, Freedom of expression has been limited to demonstrating and protesting. But for instance, even coming to speak to the dean, you're expressing yourself. Some of you come to my office in groups of three or five. We agree, but even where we disagree, we agree too. But we somehow find a solution. Others write to me petitions. Dean, there is this issue. You need to have it addressed. At times, issues I can't address, I help you and channel them to those who can. So there are other ways of expressing yourselves. You can write, you can come to my office. Those of you who cannot, there are some of you who can't speak for yourselves. You speak through friends. Hmm? Friends or better halves. You can go through them and reach out to the dean. But we have an able team at the faculty and the university to help you deal with several problems that you may have and challenges. So I would like to categorically state it in the most clear terms. The faculty or the school is always open. So is the dean's office.
please write, please come. And I hope uh, we don't have to get to a situation where, but even uh, the case that is being talked about, in my opinion, students had the right. But I think there are also some, some things that could have been done better on the part of the students. And usually, just like in any community, if you try to do something and, and see no one heard of, you may be the guinea pig of how it should be handled. Because at times when you bring up something new on someone, they may not know how to handle, and they may handle it in the worst way, and probably also express regret, but when damage has already been. But at least, thankfully, I know one of the students. We worked hard and helped him resume classes and even graduated, I think, in um, 2020. I don't know about the other one. But also speaking to what Mr. Mwine said, please draw a clear distinction between a protest, a demonstration, and a riot. Right? If you want to express yourselves, you take the dean hostage to your hostel, hmm? <laughs> lock, him <in. laughs> lock him in a room there. Hmm? You say, by the way, you like smarting yourself on campus. Let's undress him. <laughs> hmm? Let's undress him. Leave him in Adam's suit and he marches on campus. You start burning university vehicles. There you're now engaging in criminality. He told you what happened to him. You know, walk and talk like a Muganda. He said, Donut Mandaz. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, something happened and could have been worse. So now those ones were now venturing into criminality. So please, as Dr. Siwanyana said, this right is not absolute. You go about it the wrong way, there will be repercussions. You have a right to protest, you have a right to express yourself, to assemble, but should this infringe on the rights of others, causing disability of peace, causing disharmony, attacking people's person, hmm? engaging in riots, there will be repercussions. But still, as Dr. Sewanyana said, the Consequences or results of your misuse of these rights should also not be disproportionate to the illegality of committed. I may not say good things about you, but if you retaliate by cutting off my finger, is there any form of proportionality? Hmm? You torture me and I look as if I've been wrestling with crocodiles. Right? You saw Kakwenza. The man opened his back and was like, has this man been in a cage with a crocodile or, or something? So even the issue that is causing this content, should a missing mark or a mark that is awarded and you're not content with lead to lynching of a lecturer? Not all my staff have vehicles, but if you waylay someone who gave you a retake in one day, they are there, given pick that frying pan of cooking oil from the, the, the Rolex man and you pour cooking oil on the lecturer. Is that proportionate to your grievance? Mm -hmm. Is it? Mm -hmm. So as we exercise these rights, we should also be willing to handle the consequences that. But most importantly, exercise these rights responsibly. Mm -hmm. Not to infringe on the rights of, of others. Thank you. This is when the power dynamics change. The, you know, Dr. Mtesase was speaking here and the one who is speaking here is, 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 is being accountable here to you and having this session is really interesting that you can be able to speak to some of these things. Um, I just wanted to, to ask Dr. Livingstone Sewanyana, civil society plays a critical role in, in pushing for freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly. What we have seen, though, in, is in the recent past is a crackdown on civil society. We have seen over 50 civil society organizations that have been in the democratic spaces and in the rule of law spaces being closed. You know, those into the human rights space have been closed. Nicolas Opio, the chapter four, which is run by Nicolas Opio, is in court. Uh, you know, Sedu is going through its own challenges. So 
this crackdown on civil society, what does it mean to the freedom of expression and assembly? And what happens to civil society and its role in pushing for this when they see other you know, NGOs closed? Dr. Livingstone. Thank you, Solomon. But before I address the issue of civil society, I wanted also to say something about human rights and its enjoyment in schools, universities, and social institutions. Because it seems to be a running battle between uh, the leadership and often the student community. And it's something that is important. I wanted to start by asking you, because you are in the legal profession, you are as students of law, you want to be advocates, I believe. Are you aware that the legal profession is the most regulated profession among all other professions? Do you know what it means when you go to the Law Development Center? Can you exercise any freedom of expression there? <laughs> Can you exercise freedom of expression if you go before the law council? Can you? Can you exercise freedom of expression if you go before the Judicial Service Commission as a judicial officer? You need to take these things into account. That when we talk about these freedoms, we need to balance them with responsibility. There is an element there that often goes missing. You are entitled to the right, but you also have equally responsibility to enjoy it in a measured approach. And let me also ask, for example, do you enjoy freedom of expression at home? Do you enjoy freedom of expression in church? Do you enjoy freedom of expression in your community? You need to think about some of these issues because as far as I know, our society is largely hierarchical. Whether at the family level, whether at the community level, whether in the academic institutions, up to whatever level you talk about. So it goes back to the question of building a democratic and human rights culture. We don't seem to have that. And that is why the framers of the covenants and even our constitution were mindful when they said in a free and demonstrably democratic society. What exactly did they mean? It must be a society that cherishes some of these values, nurtures them, and does not look at them as if they are privileges. To many people, especially in, in, in authority, rights are privileges. To many of them. We need to change that so that they see it as a way of life. You see, if rights are a way of life, then this debate should not even arise. The fact that rights are not a way of life for us, they are seen more as privileges. That is why these questions continue to linger on. So I want you always to think through this carefully. Before, as a student, I always wanted to enjoy Chemtai absolute rights. I was a student leader at Makerere. I have been a student leader at Namiriango. I've been a student leader. I always thought, that why shouldn't we be given absolute academic freedom? Why shouldn't we enjoy our rights, speak whatever we want, and challenge the authority? Right now, I'm a member of the University Council, NJ University. I now understand why these fetters occur, why they become appropriate. That like what Dr. said here, that if you give that leeway, you definitely will be expected. There is no way that you can have a society which is unregulated and still have 
a normal organized society. So we need always to bear that in mind. And since you are going to be future advocates, be mindful because some of the institutions I've mentioned like LDC and others, they don't tolerate devious at all. You either do it or you don't. Is this the best approach? That is for you to ponder over. But one element, Solomon, for you to determine whether you were denied a right or you are enjoying that right, irrespective of the environment, there are three things you should always ask and put into account. Number one, have you been accorded the right to be heard? Let's assume students in the UC want to express their discontent of a matter. But first thing is whether you have been accorded the right to be heard. And the leader, whether it's the dean or the vice chancellor or whatever, must always take that into account. Have you accorded them the right to be heard? Number two, have they been parted? Are they participants? Have they been accorded the right to participate? That's very important. For example, in the decision making, in the formulation of the guideline, or whatever. That's another important ingredient. And three is what we call inclusivity. How inclusive has the process been? When you answer the three in whatever way, then you can determine whether that right is being accorded or is being denied. Now, very quickly, the crackdown on civil society. As we have put it already, the crackdown on civil society has also had a chilling effect on their performance, on their ability to defend and to stand out on various issues. And they are not different because sometimes we argue that civil society you know, does this, but civil society, Solomon and, and those listeners, is not about NGOs per se. Civil society is a bigger, broader concept. It is about media. It's about the church. It's about the private sector. It's about everyone else outside the state. So the questions that we are posing here have a, a lot of relevance to the entire society. All of us are facing the malaise I talked about. All of us are facing that chilling effect because certainly when one is attacked, all of us are attacked. And that's the issue. But I need also to point out, because if you were in court and this matter is brought before you, you mentioned the 54 NGOs and one of the NGOs is in court, there are also other things you have to consider. And, and I, I take this opportunity to also speak about this. What is the model of regulation that exists in Uganda for civil society organizations? There are three models. One model is a state-led model. The other model is a hybrid model. And the third is, of course, the restrictive one. More restrictive. No, no. Less, uh, no. It is the... The one the associational model allows people freedom to do what they want, provided they are not outside the law. The model that Uganda has adopted by enacting the NGO Act of 2016 is a state-led model. It requires what we call compliance. So, as to whether the NGO Bureau acted outside the law or not, you now need to examine whether these NGOs were compliant with the law. One of the elements of compliance is to file annual returns. If you don't file annual returns to URSB and also the NGO Bureau, you are not compliant. So the issue becomes an issue of evidence. And I believe on March 18th, we are going to get a ruling on this matter from court. If you don't comply, knowing very well that the state-led model requires compliance, then definitely your right is also in jeopardy. If you were in Britain or the United States or India or wherever, where you only inform, definitely 
it would be a different story. If we were in Malawi or Kenya, which is a hybrid model, that would also be a different story. So we need also to contextualize that chilling effect we are talking about. Because we often make people believe that, you know, there is absolute, there is absolute restriction of civic freedom or civic space. But we must also know that to enjoy that civic space we are talking about, there are also preconditions. And the preconditions are in the law. The larger question would be, can we do away with the state-led model which restricts us? If that was possible, then definitely we would have a better environment. The state has adopted that model and we as civil society and all other players interested in human rights will need to work so hard in order to change the current status quo. Thank you, Dr. Livingstone. I'm just liking what I'm hearing because these are things I don't normally hear. Um, it's always on the other side of it, right? And someone giving you this side of it is also interesting. Um, uh, uh, ben, I just want to come back to you, the, the media, which is a space where people can freely express themselves in quotes. But the media too is growingly getting scared to provide this platform. And what we are seeing is that people now have gone online to freely express themselves there because they think that the mainstream media is no longer giving them an opportunity to express themselves. So the emergency of online platforms and social media is a space people have now found solace because they feel that the media, mainstream media, is no longer giving them a platform to express themselves, largely because you're scared. You see, you will sit you off. I mean, CBS is working without a license right now, you know. Um, every other time, there are letters from UCC to radios and... Uh, it, can you imagine, even UCC asks you to suck stuff Suck so and so, suck so and so, suck so and so. Otherwise, I'm going to close you. Get that thing off, off air now. Otherwise, I'm going to switch you off. So, and, and I think it's Dr. Livingston. No, I think it's Dr. Um, Tessa who said that the state uses the legal, as long as it's politically against them, they will use every available law to come at you. So what happens to the freedom of, of expression if the media that is supposed to provide an opportunity for us to speak out now that I am not there anymore <laughs> happens. Yeah, but where is, where, where is the media in this conversation? Um, I, I think the media is still in this conversation. It's never gone away. And again, you've got to think about this from the bigger context. If, if we are going to talk about freedom of, exp of expression at the highest level, the biggest proponents of this, the biggest places where you have the highest form of freedom of expression is the Western world, in the UK and in the US. And yet we have Edward Snowden. What, what, what do you do with that? He's doing something that is supposed to be for the greater public good. He's releasing information that he feels people should know. Assange. Right? Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And the information that has come out has been mind-blowing. I think we've got to try and be careful and not be too naive to understand that the state is always going to be the state, whether it is in Bahrain or in the US. There are certain tenets of the state that are always going to be pretty much the same. And for me, that's the context in which I say that I like to look for positives and look for places where we are. And yes, we do have a lot of issues, right? And again, in the bigger context of what the state does, based on what's happening politically, there are always going to be issues. But here's how I choose to look at it. If you watch NBS on Thursday, if you listen to KFM or Capital on Saturday morning, if you listen to KFM on Friday, Andrew Mwenda and his boys, there are things that are still said here where you 
cringe and think, eh, I hope you have bail money. Right? And yet, by and large, we still have, I think Dr. Sionna mentioned this, in my opinion, we are still in a place where you can still see a lot of things. There are many countries in the world where this public lecture could never happen. The keynote that Dr. Mtesa said I gave cannot be allowed. In fact, by the time he finishes, there will be a drone waiting outside. Many, many countries, including some very near us. And the way I choose to think about it is that in the grand scheme of things, we are not in the worst place. There are issues, yes. But I think sometimes you want to take the victories that you have. But also, like Dr. Sejana said, if you look at the fact that these rights sometimes are not absolute, because the honest truth of the matter is that some of the things that get said, uh, they can become a problem. You, you've mentioned that there, there are stories which, if you, you published, can cause an entire country to ban. You have had, you as Solomon, have had stories where you look at the story, it's gold, it would definitely cause a ruckus, and then you think about the impact it will have, and you fold the paper and put it in your bag. Why? Because there's still got to be a bigger picture. Your freedom of expression does not mean that you shoot your mouth off when it could literally cause an entire country to ban. Recently, and again, now going into social media, I saw a video on WhatsApp that... Can I, can I give you an example yeah. of that? Um, what you're saying, two examples. One, I covered elections, um, the previous elections in Kenya, and at the time, what happened is that one of the presidential candidates was giving out money. Distributing money. People were queuing. Openly. Openly. The Kenyan media, none of it published that story. At the time, I was covering for NTV Kenya. Citizen, nothing. NTV, nothing. You know, KTN, nothing. But when we were monitoring international media, Al Jazeera had the story as story number one and international media. So in the morning meeting, I said, you mean we don't have this? Why is international media covering this story and we are not? And the editor says, duty of care. We know where we came from as a country. <laughs> We went through, uh, you know, we went through an, uh, you know, a violent election, and anything could tip us off. That that was the first thing, and they said, yes, we may be criticised for, you know, not speaking some of these things, but we know where we're coming from. So they decided to shut up on that story. The second incident was my incident, but I decided to speak up. When the elections were almost there in 2016. I got data that showed that the, um, the register had so many ghost voters and that it was manipulated. And I worked with Evelyn Namara, who we all know is, 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 is a tech girl. So we decoded all that and did analytics, got the data from PDF and put it in Excel, ran, ran everything, and it just looked terrible. So I went to my editor just a few weeks to the voting and I said, sir, I have evidence and it is here. I think at the time it was J.B. Mokola and he looked at me and said, do you know if you put this story out, you are going to cause chaos in this town. So sit yourself down for public good. I said, no. You know, I have a big head. So I insisted that the story ran and the story ran indeed. And it caused a lot of chaos. The opposition was protesting everything. And, you know, uh, the, 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 the Electoral Commission came out and said, we are sorry, we are sorry, but we are so far to get back. It was all commotion. But, yeah, so I feel you. When you're saying that, you know, I, I know where you're coming from. Yeah, and I think sometimes it might be the timing. So, for example, would it make sense to, again, in the interest of public good, to make sure that that story maybe comes out at a time when 
it can be used to actually create change, but not necessarily create chaos. So it can, that's a story that can be used in petitions to, as evidence and all of that. And again, the point is this, ladies and gentlemen, that while we are in an age where you can say anything that you want and it's freedom of expression, Dr. Serian has mentioned, of course, that we must understand that that's not absolute. You must always think about the implications of what it is that you're saying and what it could do. And as, as finishing with this example from a social media perspective, because like you said, a lot of people have said, let's go to social media. Over the last two, three years, and again, look at this in the context of where we are as a country, one of the most diverse countries in the world. I think if I'm not mistaken, we have about 69 or, or so, Dr. Sayonara, different tribal groupings in this country, at least say, about 69 or so, who, because of our history, we are not too far away from trouble. We are never too far away from trouble. The 2009 riots showed that very clearly. And you always get the sense that there's just something under the surface that never goes away. And we cannot bury our heads in the sand and pretend that that's not there. So when two weeks ago I saw this video, and I'm, I'm told that those guys I think were either being hunted or something like that, these two lumpens, if I can call them that, is there a word worse than lumpens? Nikompums, ba buffoons. <laughs> no, and, and you must understand this. These idiots, because they are looking for likes on TikTok and Instagram, they go and create this video, and they're basically saying, if you are in this country and you don't speak Runyankole, you're not a Ugandan. I don't know if anyone has seen that video. Well, if, if you've seen that video, a couple of people have seen that video. In fact, this is the national language. If you are not, in fact, where, where are you from? Who are you? What are you doing in our country? I like the shock on your face. <laughs> because it tells the entire story. These are people, and they're putting this out, and they are in, I think they're somewhere in Ibarra. Right? And they are clearly bragging about the fact that this country belongs to Banyankoli. Please note, I am a Munyankole from Kashari. I am suffering. <laughs> okay? For all intents and purposes, if you decided that we we're going to do a demonstration against the way Uganda is being run, I will join you, I'll be at the front. Because I have problems with the way our country is run and managed. Our systems are not working. Our institutions are not working. It's because of individuals, not because of a tribe. Fine, there are many individuals from particular tribes that will be responsible, but let's be honest. For you to put something like that out is the sort of thing where people say, ha, sewanyana, jobera tumanyi. Right? So when you start now pushing that from one side, and then another side, and then another side, do you understand why your editor in Kenya says, ah? The challenge that we have, and I'll finish with this, is that the whole lot of you don't understand what it means for a country to ban. The Kenyans learned this the hard way in 2007 because they tried the whole complete and encumbered freedom of expression and Kenya burnt. You were in, you, all three of you, and our international traveler, would know. Kenya burnt to the point where they, everyone suddenly said, okay, 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 okay. Whatever issues we have, the country is burning. Let us sit down and talk. The result of which we are seeing now, Raila Odinga being endorsed by, <laughs> right? In this country, I walked for three days in 1985 from Barra to Ntungamo, eating calabashes. You don't want to eat a calabash. It's more bitter than chloroquine. Why? Because there was a war. That war at that time was for national liberation purposes. The sort of things that people say nowadays are the sort of things that can very easily, it takes just two days for one person to say one thing and another person to say another thing, 
and then another person to get shot, and then all of a sudden, the country is on fire. The Muganda says, aha, now is our chance. Bagende. The Mnyamkere says, I'm not going anywhere. The guy from Acholi is saying, hold on a minute, we have suffered enough. No, 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 we are not having any of this. And very easily, you will burn this country to the ground. I was in Sierra Leone. And I'm trying not to get emotional because it, I'm still haunted by what I saw. Where on every corner of Freetown, you have people who have no legs and hands because they are victims of a civil war. We've never had that sort of thing in Uganda. We've had wars, yes, but not that kind of war. The sort of things that people keep saying, and I pray to God that you land fellows or soon-to-be land fellows never get caught up in that sort of stupidity where you begin to antagonize and provoke the situation because of where we are as a country. Because Uganda, as it is, for whatever reasons, based on the mistakes of our fathers and their fathers, is never far from burning because some idiot went and said, ah, if you're not a Mnyamkore, you're not a Ugandan. Does he represent all of us? Absolutely not. But Dr. Seonyana will say, ha, na, tuaba gamba, babo. Where does that end? And so for me, even as we look at social media becoming the new platform that allows us to express ourselves, there's a reason why Dr. Mtesa said I mentioned this about regulation. And it, I will take it back to where I started. If you can't be a law unto yourself, before the government regulates, if I'm not regulating myself, if I'm not thinking about what I'm saying and the impact that it has, then it doesn't matter what rights you have. You will burn the country to the ground. All right, Ben Mwine, thank you very much. Let's give Ben some love. <laughs> but there's a flip side to it. So it's a space where we can come out and speak about the excesses of the state without being scared professionally and just saying, you know what? I stand against this. I don't like the way people are tortured. You can't use, you can't shred people's backs. You can't use pliers on, on their skins. You can't do that. You just can't do that. And because the media is scared of me saying that on their different platforms, then social media provides an opportunity for people to speak up about the way they are governed. And it's a force, quite a big force that right now, government has verified accounts. There's a verified account for government of Uganda the easiest way you can speak to anyone, the people in high places, is tag them in a tweet and they will react. Your Excellency President, stop, you know, stop this ABCD. Oh, Solomon said, Wanja, what you said is really bad or whatever. And they will see it. And, and, and I think that what the social spaces have provided with us, the opportunities, they have opened up you know, platforms for expression that people can now speak to themselves. And embracing technology that has come along with social media, in my view, has given people an opportunity to speak up and be heard. I think I can give you three, three, three examples. And before I come to Chemtai, Facebook Live is here. You know, whilst Facebook Live has had its issues, it is an opportunity for citizen journalists, for example, to come and say, I have information, maybe it has been verified and all that, and gives it out to the people who are watching. Twitter Spaces, the latest innovation by Twitter, is a platform where you have so many people listening in to mature conversations, whilst there are those that, you know, that really are bad, but then there are also those that you know, bring people together to voice out their concerns. I mean, I host Twitter spaces every week. I can see that the level of debate and maturity and the way people express themselves is, is amazing. And, and people say things that they, are, they would never have said if, you know, if they were never given an opportunity to. 
And so Ben, whilst I agree with you, but I also think that what social media has done is it has widened the civic space that is shrinking with um, you know, civil society, religion, and thank you for teaching us about civil, so civil society. That is beyond NGOs, that it's, it's religious organizations, that it's, you know, it's, it's the media and everything. All right, I'll, I'll have you the fi final tech before I can um, you know, ask you to raise your contributions and comments. You heard it um, from, from the dean who is saying, look, be nice in the way you do some of these things. Explore all these different avenues. It's only at the time when you don't feel hard that people now come up and, and assemble and protest since students are not hard. It gets to that. You know, you try, you talk to the lecturer, they play around, you talk to the to, to the head player around, you go to the dean, we are sorting these issues, we are working on them. And then you're like, you know what, I think we are not being hard. But where do we go from here? What do you want the dean and the university to do on the grievances that you raise? Do you want more freedom to express yourself and to assemble and to demonstrate because the law the Constitution says that we, sh we have all the right to demonstrate against things that we don't feel we like. I think Dr. Mutesa Sida said that the law is there to demonstrate, but in practice, I think Ben and, uh, and Dr. Sawanyana said, it's theoretical, but in practice, is it really working? Chemtai. Uh, thank you so much, um, Mr. Solomon Saranja. Uh, thank you. My closest neighbor, Mr. Dr. Mwine, I would like to first add to what you said. As we all know that rights come with responsibilities, and as a legal scholar, we always quote the law, jurisprudence. So there is a case of, um, it's an Indian case, they have difficult names, but I'll share my paper sometime. <laughs> so this case of Rangarajan versus Jag Jivan, and others versus Jagvan, Ram, and others. It's a Supreme Court decision. Um, talks about, it expounds more on, on the aspect of protection of the rights and limitation of the rights. So it says, there does indeed have to be a compromise between the interests of freedom of expression and social interest. There has to be a compromise between those two. But we cannot simply balance the two interests as if they were of equal weight. Our commitment to freedom of expression demands that it cannot be suppressed unless the situation, situations created by allowing the freedom, oppressing, and the community interest is endangered. The anticipated danger should not be remote, conjectural, or forfeit. It should be proximate and have a direct nexus with the expression. That's just what you talked about. Yeah. So, Mr. Dean, with all due respect, <laughs> we appreciate you. We appreciate the platform that you've created for the students. Um, I think we've not seen so many demonstrations. We don't really have them. Yeah, because our needs are most of the time met. We have an amazing registrar, Mr. Andrew. He's, he deserves a bigger hand clap. He's the link, he's a direct link to the students. You can always call him at any time um, and complain, and he always listens. His doors are always open and he's always available. He mixes up with the students, he comes for our fellowships and all these things. So I think that has been one of the innovations that the faculty has made. We didn't have that. So I think most of our burdens are being cared for in that way. And moving on to requesting for platforms, we as students request that uh, we be given, you know, we be given the platform to reiterate our uh, grievances. We, we, 
the reasons why we have demonstrations in other universities like Makere, Kiambogo, and all these is because students don't feel hard. They do not feel hard. We wouldn't go out there and um, endanger ourselves if we're given the platform to talk about all this. And the students also um, do not know their rights most of the time and also their obligations. So maybe before you start um, downplaying their requests and their grievances, how about you first um, teach them about what they're entitled to and what their responsibilities are? Because as Dean said, someone will not do exams and then come and tell you, if you do not give me marks, I'm going to undress. Do they know that they'll not graduate without, you know, completing all the assignments? Or they feel like the Dean is Superman and he can change all this. He has a, a say and he will just go and fix for you marks. So before we go to the extremes as students, we need to know our rights and obligations. And the faculty should also play a bigger role. Or the university should go ahead and um, tell the students, give them, show them their obligations and their rights as well. Tell them, you guys have a right to this, you have a right to complain, but before you complain, have you done your part? Most of them do not know this, they do not know this. And then when we're talking about the media, these are not only law students, we have media and the law students from the Faculty of Journalism. I'm sure they're here, we have Ivan around there. And what's, which kind of journalists are we bringing up, you know? Um, when they see their fellows being beaten, being denied the right to express, being th th the right to talk about pertinent issues in the society, being suppressed what do they think of that you know what which kind of breed of journalists are we bringing up if they are seeing the predecessors giving up on covering the news because they're being tortured and all this is it even going to be necessary anymore to have the profession of journalism Ben do you want to take that on or do you want me to take it on ah I am a moderator. <laughs> um, I, I look, they've, they've already said that journalism was going to die. When Facebook started, they said this is the end. When Twitter came, they said this is the end. There are certain things that you'll never be able to take away. What Solomon does with um, AIJ is something that is difficult to do just by being on social media the training that he has gone through, the training that the journalists here are going through, the stuff that we're talking about, the bigger picture, there's always going to be a place for that. And I can understand why UCC, for example, will then come and say, we need to be in a place where if you're going to be a journalist or claim to be disseminating information, because freedom of expression is not just about saying what you want. It's also about the right to seek information. It's about the right to receive information. One of the things that we've not talked about today that I think is very big in regard to what you're saying is the issue of misinformation and disinformation. And we know how much of a problem that is. Russia and Ukraine are fighting. Then you see a video that says 40 Russian planes have been shot down. It turns out that was actually from the Iraq war in 2003. But by the time that information gets corrected, it's done the rounds, and it doesn't come back. When I come and say, Chemtai stole my chicken, and put it on Twitter, hashtag thief, well, hashtag international thief, and we say, right? <laughs> Even if I delete that tweet, there will be enough people who have taken a screenshot, and are going to use that. Will I ever be able to fix her reputation? Is it fair? So I've, I've used my rights, right, to express myself, but where does it leave her rights to be heard, to be given a fair hearing? One of the dangers that has come with, so I'm, I'm going to sound like I don't like social media, so Solomon, please don't hate me. 
But one of my gripes with social media is that people suddenly make themselves authorities on things without understanding the damage that they create. And while there's a lot of good things that are happening, again, to the same thing that she said and that he said, they are having to be that balance where, yes, we have a freedom of expression, but can we be sensitive to what's happening with other people? And I think that's where, while the journalists are seeing their friends being beaten up, can they then be able to learn and say, how do we find a better way of working with the state? What sort of, I think you mentioned the need for dialogue and relationships, both you and, and uh, Dr. Mtisasira. How do you, as the next breed of journalists and lawyers, work on building a society where a one enanga is not enemy of the press, right, but becomes a partner? We had a guy, um, Simeon Nsubuga, right? You get the point? You get the point? Was his famous catchphrase. Simon Nisubuga, who I think is now an ex-MP, was an MP in the last parliament, was actually a police uh, PR. And he had the distinction of, I think at some point actually being reprimanded by his bosses for being too friendly with the media. Because there are times when he would say, look, okay, what you're saying, I agree with. What our people did is unacceptable and I don't condone it, and I am speaking on behalf of the police. And of course his bosses will say, how dare you say that? You have to be on our side. He's like, but look, they beat up a journalist without due cause, without justification. How am I supposed to go and defend that, right? So having that balance of how do we build that sort of relationship where somebody is not coming and saying, we are going to kill you so that we can prevent you from, <laughs> from dying and we are doing it for your own good, to be in a place where there's that very good balance where if things are unacceptable, they're unacceptable and people are able to call them out. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, jo uh, ben Mwine, thank you. Let's give him some love. All right, it's your time to talk back. I'm just gonna select a maximum of 10 people. When you get the mic, Viola, can someone help me move the mic around, please? Ah, oh, you, oh, you, they should come here. The process of, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, great. Okay, great. I'm just going to give an opportunity to 10 people, and I am so biased towards ladies, but I will, I will give an opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. You can come here and, uh, and, and give your view. And then I'll have another mom. Where are the ladies? Yes, mom. So you can also be here in the queue. I'll also have you, sir. And you, sir. And you, sir. And you, sir. Ladies, where are you at? Okay, cool. We'll first have that. Okay, please start. I'm just buying time for you to walk here. Your, you introduce yourself, your comment, or reaction. Is that mic on, though? Let's just see if we can switch it on. Okay, come closer to the mic, I guess. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Wandia Karecho. I've come here on... I want to wrap all that has been said in my words. And here they are. I'll take all this under one word. That is parenting from all what has been said, according to me. Here are situations where our parents, and even when you're not a parent, you will soon be, and those, those who are not willing to be, still you, you are a parent as an African. You can't leave this world without saying you don't have a child or you're not a parent. Everybody's a parent. The fact that your sister has children, your brother, you're a parent. Okay. So this issue comes in this scenario where I'm speaking on the side of those people who I'm speaking can on we, the can we listen of, to each other? of demonstration, uh, rioting, and that other, the third one. Okay. I, I know you know it because he is protesting. Uh, it comes a scenario where as 
our parents, right away from down there when we are growing up, some of these pupils or babies or children who in the end become adults. Solving issues in their homes is like this. Some of them, the child, like child, children, you see it from childhood. When they want something, someone just falls down roughly and then the parents act. Instead of the parent saying, if you do that, I'm insisting I'm not going to do, to do this. Why am I saying so? If you have an issue with someone, me, if I have an issue with someone, even you, my immediate friend, you will never know. The solution is you and the other person. But the problems come in because of such parenting that problems come in when you bring in third parties. You have the issue between you two people. Let me say my lecturer and me. Me, instead of coming to you thinking for your other knowledge, I'll go insist, talk to the lecturer. And by the way, learn to study the mood of the person with whom you are conflicting. Thank you. There is a time when you, some two minutes, there is a time when you talk to the person and, the, and that time you see the approach. There is a time when you see that the, this time I've, I've confronted this lecturer or this person, but it seems like the mood is not. Please don't give up, persist. Later, first give the person time, still go back, but don't think for advice from third parties. That's when you land into wrangles with a lecturer, with so and so, because it, it will go viral. All right, thank you. Thank you. Parenting, learn the mood. But what if the mood is always bad? <laughs> yes, you're welcome, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Ahewa Ketra. I'm a third year law student. Uh, Mr. Solomon, you talked about something that uh, most of the times uh, when we are tweeting, we need to tag these people, these leaders into our tweets so that they are able to read. But most of the times you find that even the leaders we are tagging, it is, they don't even read those things. Uh, beginning of this week, uh, in Mukono and around Mukono and in our hostels, we've had a challenge of theft. And we talk to the security people, but nothing has been done. So this person comes in and tags the Uganda police, tags the security of UCU, tags the vice chancellor himself, but nothing is being done. So I, I don't know what, I, I, I think we need your advice on on if, if you see people demo, uh, demonstrating and you know, expressing themselves, it's because they've had, they've had to, you know, they've looked for ways of settling those things, but it has failed for them. So they come up and demonstrate. I actually believe in those that demonstrate because they're grieved. I mean, they have tried all measures, but those measures have failed. So I definitely feel that even us tagging those people, it doesn't help. We are not being helped as maybe students. Let me bring it up in the point of, you know, students. That we talk and we talk and we talk and nothing is being done. And even when, the, you know, you, you have a meeting today or the dialogues that you're telling us that we have in UCU. I am a leader personally, but the dialogues we have, you wait for two weeks and nothing has been done. And someone is telling you, by the way, we did it. Eee, what did you do? You didn't even give us you know, feedback and stuff like that. So I feel like we need, uh, we need you to help us uh, and advise, advise us on you know, how shall we then handle those people that actually don't listen to our grievances. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, ben, do you When people feel that they are not being heard, then they burst out. And when, they have, and when the spaces close in where they should speak up about these things, then they go all out. And, and anyone, we, are, we are talking about freedom of expression and assembly. Solomon, You're I was just going to say, anyone who is married will tell you that's very true. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Yes. Yes, uh, thank I you. hope we are noting these things, we, we react to them. You're welcome, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Gavin Mugisha. I am a fourth year law student, uh, uh, human rights twala. <laughs> yes, so I, I take human rights. So this is the thing. I, I had an opinion that came from a place, from mostly what Ketra was talking about, right? 
she's speaking about us now moving the activism to social media. But I want to believe that social media is sort of giving us that sort of um, clean place that is not actually creating the change that we need. If your first thought when an issue goes wrong is to tweet about it, <laughs> then surely we are thinking expressionally in a wrong way. You know, and I think that this has become sort of a place where we are comfortable at being because everyone can get a phone and tweet, right? But not everyone can move to the dean's office and say, by the way, missing marks are there. We have problems, you know, and the more we keep on consolidating ourselves in, you know, we can tweet about this, we can use our social media, we can TikTok about it. The situation is actually curtailed and we remain in that place. The, the, and another thing I want to talk about, the American Constitution and uh, the First Amendment of the American Constitution. Uh, the American Bar Association is actually here, so it's a good place that they understand this. The First Amendment provides that you have the right to express yourself, but also you, are not sub you cannot be compelled to say something that you do not want to actually retaliate, right? And you see, the thing with that is that we are giving... Um, the thing with that is that it gives the power to the citizen to choose either to activate themselves on that right or to just choose to let it be, you know? So the power in the American Constitution is to the people. When you come here in Uganda, Chapter 4 particularly, I think it's Article 20 or 21, provides that the rights are inherent but not granted by the state, you know? But yet when we are having issues and we want to get onto the streets, we want to protest about them, we have to go to the police and someone tells you, I need to ask for permission. You know, you are seeking for permission, which I feel is a wrong narrative. What you're doing to the police when you go there is that, guys, we are going to protest, you know. Come stand with us, walk with us on this road, ensure that the businesses are not, you know, that we are not doing anything wrong to the businesses. Move with the people to ensure that they are secure and that we do this in a more secure place. And I think that is where our minds need to move at. And then uh, lastly, I also want to say that you see, the, the right to freedom of expression and assembly is not there to aid social evils and immoral character, you know? So while they are speaking here broadly about the, the case issue and um, telling us how it was really wrong, you know, that he wasn't given a fair hearing, but yet a committee of parliament sat and actually gave him a hearing, but he failed to turn up. This is the same Zake that has never been of good repute. Zake has always had issues even before he was a member of parliament. But then you are saying, but he has the right to say all the things of abusing the, the right honorable speak of parliament. But then you see, the right of freedom of expression does not guarantee you the right to show your immorality and to express your immorality in that sense. And so the restrictions should be towards what should society accept, like they were saying, and where should the limit be drawn, and can we accept the limit that you cannot abuse and we say it is your right, you know? Can we accept the limit as well? So I think that is uh, the conversation generally. Thank you. It's the freedom of expression and of assembly. Thank you. Next. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I'm called Mukemba Daniel. I am doing apportionment in the second year, but you know, I, I love, I, 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 I love uh, my rights so much. I am a member of the Young African Leadership in Initiative. I think mo most, of you, most of you, you know about it. So. Uh, first of all, I, 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 want, I, I want to thank Mr. Solomon for your efforts, but uh, I want to say something. First of all, in Uganda, the right to freedom uh, has been constrained by, by, by major police because uh, I remember last year, no, last month, if not in, in, in January, uh, some fellows, uh, they wanted to, to, to take uh, a, a letter to, to the UN, but the police told them, no, you have nowhere to go. But again, when Major General Kahindo Tafiri was sanctioned, there, there are also some fellows who felt they, they, they were hurt, and I was very shocked to see the police was esc escorting them, taking the what? Taking the letter. But, but, but again, th these people who asked at first to be given the, the chance to take the, the letter, we had denied the what? The chance. So uh, for me, 
I think we should also sit, sit down and look. The police should also be given uh, rules and maybe ways how, how to enforce that thing. And another issue yeah, is, is about the censure of, of Zake. I don't do law, but at least I, I think my colleagues from law, yeah, if, if I'm wrong, you can correct me. I, 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 I hear provocation is a what? A defense. Am I right? No? <laughs> Am I right? Yes. So, uh, before, I, 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 I follow Zake on Twitter and Facebook. So, before him making that statement, I remember the, the right honorable deputy speaker. She did a statement, and which I think, even if I was the one, I would do what Zake did. Because at first, the guy was silent, but, but again, because... But, but again, because of the provocation that was the, 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 the deputy speaker caused on, uh, on, on him, I, 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 I think it, it is what caused the, what, the issue. And, and, and I think when he goes to court, nothing will, will, will be nullified. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's the right to freedom of expression and assembly. And I think in this room we are moving forward because people are talking. Yes, good afternoon to all of us. My, my name is Fred. This Fred. is a space where people give themselves the opportunity to choose themselves. But yes, you're welcome. <laughs> yes, sir, you can. Yes, my name is Fred, Fred Burondo. I'm a first year law student. Now, in uh, 2019, Preet Barr, a former prosecutor in the American courts, wrote a book titled Doing Justice. A very, very nice book. I'd recommend it to everyone. But inside there, I was opened to a very good defense summation by Clarence Darrow, the lawyer for the damned, attorney for the damned. The, the defense summation was given in the case of the people versus Henry Sweet. And in that summation, uh, so what happened? Okay, the simple facts were these, that Dr. Ozian Sweet had come to a white neighborhood. These were black people. They came to a white neighborhood, but these whites these didn't like the people because of the black as, uh, problems. So they came and rained on their house, hit it with uh, the whites, came and tried to kill, this, try and chase away these people from the neighborhood and tried to literally beat them up. But the brother, who is Henry Sweet, tried to shoot a gun in space, but in that tried and killed a what? A white man. What happened was the gentleman was taken, of course, to court and the, the story was the murder issue. But the Clarence Darrow summation is my issue here. It was the defense counsel. And Clarence Darrow said these words. He said, the black American, the law has made him equal to any normal man, but man has failed to make that person equal. Same is the problem we have here. The law has made all of us literally equal. But man, man, us, same in school, nothing. All these things, every person that walks out and tortures someone, someone who tries to kill someone's right, is a human being. These are not animals. Literally, who went to school, I'm sorry to say. Same persons like all of us that are here. Then why? Clarence Darrow said, the law is like an unsung violin. Until us as ourselves come up and be good human beings, the law forever will remain silent. So my call that I bring to all of us here is to be good human beings in the first place. So I'll conclude with a question to our panelists. And mine is with prisoners. Yes, we may assume prison is not there, but it is there. And I have gotten a chance to read the diary of a prisoner. And I have tried, by a Ugandan prisoner, not of course published, but I have also gotten a chance to read published diaries of prisoners. There's something that happens. What happens to the right of prisoners when they are arrested and detained? 
Do they all die? The only instance that prison exists is to literally bring you in one area, control you in that area, because the role is to separate you from society. But when we separate you, it doesn't mean we are taking away all your rights. So the question is, what happens? Because I'll give you a case. Eric Gillison, any one of you that has internet, try and search. These, there were about three. And same in that book. Eric, Eric Gillison and other people, the, uh, the, the other two people, I think, they were wrongly charged of kill, of, of the murder of, of, um, of, 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 of Diop. But what happened is, what my issue is not the, the murder and all these things, but after 19 years, the issue was because of these letters that come from prisons making themselves in the prosecutor's offices, that one of the prosecutors, who even knew about the details of, the, of what happened by killing the evidence, got to land on this letter. And it was after 19 years of these people being in prison, a letter written by Eric Gillison, that these people managed to get justice. After 19 years in jail, life had ended. So my question is, where is this right of expression in the prisons? Because I believe some of the people, like the letters I've read, I've read, I've read diaries like I've told you. Many people are in that jail. They can't say nothing. They know, have nowhere to even write. There are people right. who are poor, extremely poor. People can even change religion in prison because of soap. You change a religion because someone is rich and the only thing for you to get that soap is because they have some money. So where is the writing? I'm sorry for the taking time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The law has made us equal, but human beings have refused. <laughs> Dr. Mutesa Asira. Yes, each of us has one minute because we, I, I promised this audience that we will get out here by one o'clock. You're welcome. Yes, uh, Jonathan Afunadula is my name, a second year law student. Well, to start with, um, I'm not going to bring in any case, but uh, I'm going to mainly speak about facts. First and foremost, uh, the problem is not, is not really the people they are leading, but the problem is the system. Why am I saying the problem is a system? You know, the system, I mean the institutions we go through and where we come from. Now, based on character. One, if I speak about uh, the institutions, we all have to speak for ourselves. But now, uh, we come to the leaders of these institutions. Are they ready to listen to us? I'm very happy that our dean is present. Well, he may act good because we are around, but, uh, and maybe because he's speaking to us publicly, but how best is he doing it? Now, Uganda Christian University as a university, this is my second year here. Yes, I provide each and everything, but that's, that should, we should not really get taken up by that because I think the money we pay is, is really too much. So that's, that's, that's not really a big deal. Are they providing what we want? Are they providing? Now, what we want is, of course, if we speak about food, what, that's something that we should really have. But now we go back to the maths. Now, I want Jonathan Afnadula will move for the whole year looking for maths, actually coursework maths. Now, how best can we do with that? I spoke about the problem being the system. Now it goes to the lecturers, it goes to the dean, I'm sorry to say this, it goes to the VC, but uh, we should look at the system. The system is the problem. We all know that we, we have, you know, a right to speak and do what. We all know that. But wh where is the problem coming from? Because if you go out and speak, they will say you bring in chaos. If you keep quiet still, they will come for you. So what is the best thing we should do? So the problem is character and the systems that we go through. Thank you very much. Dr. Mutesa, you have a lot of um, questions to answer, sir. Good yes, you're welcome, ma'am. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nsima Chloe Elizabeth. I am a first year law student. Uh, referring to what Ketra was saying, uh, last, uh, I think a week or two ago, uh, at our hostel, we, ex we had someone who, who was robbed or they stole from her, yeah? 
And she went and presented her issue to the custodian and to the hostel owners because they really stole a lot of things that were really valuable. And their response was, you bring in people in your room all the time that could have been possible what? Thieves. And then, you know, I, th she, I think she felt in her, for, for her, as her, she felt like she wasn't being listened to so much that she had to report the custodian and the custodian was arrested. So my question here is, did she really have to go as far as um, making sure the custodian was arrested for the hostel owners to finally wake up and really investigate the issue? Couldn't they really have said, you know, looked at the, their side like, yes, we have security, yes, we have all these rules in place, but why is it that uh, her things were stolen, yeah? Because it could have been a, an issue with security, it could have been an issue with, I don't know, maybe the way the hostel is handled. But the fact that she had to first report the custodian to the, to, the what? to the police for them to finally step up and say, let's try to improve. Yeah? So how are we getting our voices listened to? Our, is our right to freedom of expression really there? Like, why are the leaders making it look like we are the victims? Yet, in actual sense, it would be our leaders who are not giving us the ground. Do we really have to strike? Do we have to have demonstrations before someone can finally say, oh my God, the problem is actually with us, the leaders, yeah? So unless we are given that ground to express ourselves and have our issues listened to, then maybe there we shall be moving forward. But other than that, I see we are really moving backwards when it comes to listening to people's issues and their freedom to expression. Thank you very much. Wow. Dean. I'll come to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Okelo Jelo Yet, President elect of the Uganda Christian University Law Society. Uh, one of the things I've usually been posed with, one of the questions I've been posed with, and one of the problems greatly faced by the members of my society is the issue of missing marks. And I come with a rather practical solution, given the, actually the theme, the right to freedom of expression and assembly. So this goes to uh, Mr. Dean, uh, to the Dean, Dr. Davis Motesashira. Uh, let's talk about the freedom of assembly. In my proposal, how about if we have a semester, in the semester, we have instances where we shall have two assemblies where the members of the society, uh, let's say the members of the law society, uh, come up and you, the members of the faculty, Let's say like this panel, like how we are seated here, you sit with some of the lecturers, the lecturers of which have been formidable in a, in a circumstance that students have had great complaints about them. Let's say, for example, in my year one, we have a lecturer who taught us contract law, and from year one, some of our members in year three have not gotten their marks. So these lecturers, how about we pick them, and during those assemblies, they hold them, we hold them accountable in front of you, and the students hold them accountable. <laughs> As, as, as to why our marks are still missing from year one. And then, let's say that's the first assembly, that the second assembly is to, as to regards to why, what steps have been taken as, as to refer, reference to the first assembly. Because the right to assembly is, 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 an, is granted by Article 29.1D of the Constitution. And it goes on. People keep on saying, in Uganda Christian University, you cannot talk. So how about if we have the assembly, the first assembly, we lay our complaints, we come up with a list of those lecturers who have failed to actually account from year one. Now, if we come up with them, we sit here, they answer our questions, then we have the second assembly. If they don't provide solutions as to our first problem in the first assembly, then we'll be given the right to demonstrate with banners because we have to work. Yes, and I usually tell people this, before you demonstrate, is the law with you? Now, you will complain the right to fair hearing. It will be a right to fair hearing where the students are asking the lecturers, the lecturers are responding, we have assembled rightly, it is peaceful, both, of, both parties have been heard, you have not actually given us the remedy. How, that being the case, let us move with the banners. So that the whole, yes, the whole society knows that, yes, these people have taken the necessary steps. So Mr. Dean, I humbly ask you, will that assembly be granted? Because it will handle a greater good than me personally, or a few people coming to you in your office that we have these complaints. How about if we have an assembly twice in the semester where law students will ask you 
with those lecturers whose names will have formulated by the society and they hold their account. Thank you so much. Wow. I'll tell you, I'll tell you something about this lot and I think you should clap for yourselves that you speak to the dean without fear or favor. You face the dean. Dean, thank you. <laughs> freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. UCU is speaking. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Wamahoro Doreen, a first year law student. So, my, what I'm going to say here is basically an observation and not a question. So, as Af okay, not as Africans, as people, we are sometimes the problem. Um, a wise man once said, if we keep on doing what we are doing, we're going to keep on getting what we are getting. So at most times we come up and say there is corruption, that these problems that are happening, I'm starting with a problem of corruption. But we're telling our leaders, you know, there is corruption. We are coming up with an anti-corruption court. But at the end of the day, when a police officer stops you, you're the same person who's going to give the police officer a bribe. So what I'm saying is that if we want to combat a problem, it's better to begin at the grassroots. What are you doing? Someone mentioned parenting. What are you doing in your family? If you are the father who is going to I don't know, back at your child when your child speaks out to you, then you're the same father who's going to stand up at the platform and mention there is no freedom of expression in the country, yet you're not giving that freedom of expression in your family, then there are a lot of fathers doing that or parents doing that. So how do you expect a country to be better? So I think as humans, we need to accept correction. Yes, we need to accept correction because most of the problems that come as side effects of freedom of expression, if I come up and I express myself, let's say the various students that are coming up to express themselves to the dean, and the dean is going to react in, I'm not saying that's how he's going to react, but if he reacts in a wrong way, then in the end, he has refused to accept correction. So as human beings, we need to accept correction and as leaders of tomorrow. If we accept correction, then you're going to give someone freedom of expression. Then the second thing is, I, very many of us have heard of civil disobedience. Um, those days, black Americans, when the, the 1700s, when people were fighting racism, um, the way they mentioned that it's better to come up and give out your grievances in a good way. The dean mentioned you don't, come, you don't have to come and undress. Give out your grievances in a good way. That is better. Then the other thing is that what are we expressing really? As the 21st century, we are saying a lot of useless things, I should say. You come up and you're mentioning a lot of things that are actually not going to benefit people. We have a lot of MPs, we have a lot of leaders that are out there, but are mentioning a lot of things that are actually not useful to us. Yet every single day we pass by Kampala streets, people are starving, people are on the streets, and you're asking yourself, do we really have a nation? So as people that are being nurtured through all this, what we are expressing matters. You're not going to come and say certain things that do not matter to us just because you have your freedom of expression. And how are you doing that freedom of expression? Then third of all, and most importantly, learn to accept correction so that the freedom of expression is better. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much. All protocol observed. Good afternoon. afternoon. My name is Kamita Anna Miracle. I'm in first year law school. Before I speak, I would like the whole audience to give a hand of thanks to the Launchpad for grooming eloquent speakers. Please. <laughs> so on that note, I want to say two things. The first thing is, someone asked whether social media has been used for the right purposes. I personally feel like our generation is taking it to another level. Like you hear very serious issues, for example, the Ukraine-Russia war, and it's a big deal internationally. And then five seconds later, there is a meme. 
about something, you're all laughing because you know it's true. There's always some silly meme making these grave issues not a big deal anymore. So I think part of the freedom of expression has been misused in terms of social media and the memes that we keep sending around. That's the first thing. The second thing I'm going to say is an observation about universities and how they deal with students' freedom of expression. So um, the platform may be given, the students may be given a chance to say what is oppressing them. But as a university, I've, I've seen so many scenarios where MOOC students have striked for all sorts of reasons. Recently, there was a strike in MOOBs. There are so many strikes. And someone asked me, why is it that in UCU you don't strike? And I said, we are just legit, and we are formal and official. <laughs> that was my defense. But the truth is that these students seated down here have issues. They have expressed them. They may have been given a platform. But after the arrests are being done, yes, we may be expressing ourselves in all the wrong ways. Sometimes we burn cars, we do things, we gun torture that lecturers, we gun undress, like that. different examples have been given. But after all this has been curbed, what is being done by the university? Can the university explain why they are missing marks? Can the university explain why the tuition is so high? Can, that, can you justify these things so that you give us a reason to continue existing in, the law, in these different universities we are taking part of? Yes, so my observation goes back to the university um, big people that please, after curbing the bad cultures we have used to express ourselves, go on and answer the issues. Because behind the riot, behind the strike, behind the protest, there is an issue. Focus on that issue and answer it, and then you can go ahead. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Can I say that these are the, the only people who should be speaking? I think I, I have to say that. Um, I think these are the only ones. Dean, you've heard about it. You know, you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> but hopefully you can be able to answer that. So, you see you are legit. That's why they are not... Uh, <laughs> right, not uh. All right. Freedom of expression. You're welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nena Beatrice Sayat, third year law student, Stream B. So... My observation generally, I would like to start with this. The reason as to why most of our rights have been violated without like freedom ex of expression and assembly is not an, an exception. It's because a certain particular group of people feel like they own the country. My reason being, you have ne if you are told you have never met a security officer, then you don't know what I am talking about. Those people don't understand. You're trying to explain. They want it their way. And that is the reason as to why the IGP, Mr. Ochola, yeah, that is why he made that particular statement he said. It's because he feels he's above the law. There is nothing that can be done to him. And then also my other issue is, um, Dr. Livingstone, you, 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 you gave an example that LDC does not tolerate speaking up. And it does not accord people that freedom, okay, that, that, I don't know, that right to fair hearing. What are we going to do about it? The question is, what are we going to do about it? Because we have seen people, people are dying. Depression is real. People do die. I think that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sewanyana, should we let things be the way they are? Or should we stand up and demand for change that people are heard and they are listened to? Freedom of expression. All protocol of the observed. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I have, I have an observation and also a couple of questions. I was very keen and very critical when I was listening to Dr. Livingstone 
when he was giving us uh, the way institutions like Uganda Christian University should handle the right uh, to freedom of expression and assembly. He laid down these three important rules. Number one, have, they, have the students in this scenario been accorded with the right to be heard? And the dean responded in the affirmative by saying that yes, we've been accorded this right to be heard by him giving examples like his office is open to each and everyone to come and you know, giving their queries right to be heard. But that is not my point. My point was on the second rule. Have they been included in the decision making? And for Uganda Christian University, I'm not going to be uh, very humble or civil on it, the answer is no to a large extent. Have they been accorded, listen keenly, have they been accorded the right to be involved in this decision making? Now, the biggest issue I think that most of the law students or most of the students in Uganda Christian University have is the issue of marks. Now, this is how this decision or this issue was being held this semester. They told the students that if you've had missing marks of the online semesters, you can all bear me witness, they told the students to redo these examinations. But I'm still going back on the point of involve us in this decision making. You, we have bodies in this university. We have the guild government and we have the law society. With all evidence accorded, I don't think any of those student lead leaders even attended these meetings when they were making such a decisions. How are you involving the students in the decision making of the university? You need to include us in these decisions. Because as a law student, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to we suffered doing these examinations during COVID-19, your home, internet is disturbing you, then I do my paper, you tell me number one, upload it on Moodle, I do so. After that, you tell me, send it to an email, then at the end of the day, you lose my exam and you tell me to redo this paper. I am a third year law student, you're telling me to redo a paper I did in first year. Is that fair? It is not fair. You need to start including these, these students in your decision making because we have a right to be heard and for you to involve us in this decision making. Then lastly, still, Dr. Livingstone gave us, uh, he told us that yes, the right to freedom and, uh, of expression and assembly has restrictions. Now my question is, yes, it has restrictions, but are those restrictions clearly laid down in the laws of this country? Are those restrictions clear? Are they clear? And if they are clear, how has the government or how have these institutions tried to make the public aware of these restrictions so that when people are trying to uh, protest or bring up, enforce their right to freedom of expression and assembly, they can uh, bring it up according to those guidelines or what the restrictions have laid down. If the restrictions are there, to what extent has the government or the institutions uh, ensured that the public knows about these rights? Thank you so much. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are listening. You are talking. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Agawa Jonathan. I'm in third year, law student. And uh, I'd, want, I'd like to begin by thanking the audience and the panelists, because this has been a very fruitful discussion, because I was actually skeptical originally, because we talk about human rights, but no one actually does anything about it. That's one. Number two, as I was coming, and uh, a few of my friends told me to address a particular issue in regards to uh, our very own community in the UCU whereby last sem, a lecturer comes, appears in class for two times, and after that, gives three quarters of the class retakes. And in the end, there is no remedy, and these guys are doing retakes for something that maybe could have been addressed another way. And we need redress on that. Number two, regarding the media, we pray for a little objectivity. We are citizens, because as I came, I sat down and uh, I found a documentary airing, and I could not relate with any of these particular people because all we have done is make noise. Now, for example, if I turn on UBC, like the, the television, most likely I'll come with this mindset of this was most likely propaganda, right? Then you go to another television station and they are showing opposition only. 
All we want is an, a lens of objectivity. For example, Mr. Saranja, you, you made a documentary, Stealing from the Sick. I commend you on that. Because let's admit the good that the government has done. Let's admit the bad that the opposition has done. And let us come together on an accountable seat and be like, government, why are you doing this? Right? Furthermore, I also want to talk about the fact that the freedom of speech and expression is very important, as Mr. Ben Winners further elucidated. But can we afford it? The countries we are benchmarking on in regards to the freedom of speech include America, England, Russia. They can afford it. Can we afford a few individuals to burn, out, to burn down our country because of the fact that they feel they have a bigger opinion or just because they are the loudest on the bus? Does it mean they are right? Right? So in my submission, I humbly submit that sometimes we may afford the freedom of speech. But in this particular country, in a country where we have over 160-something tribes, we cannot afford it because we are sitting on a tight ship. And in regards to the media, let us be objective. Let us bring government to book in areas where they have fallen short, and let us bring um, the opposition to book in areas where they are being, they're just spreading false rumors. Just a little objectivity. Thank you very much. Little objectivity. You are talking, we are listening. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Akuraja Andrew, a second year law student. Now, my first issue is also about Max, but I believe everyone has addressed that one, and it has been noted. Now, my second issue is about um, freedom of expression, and particularly under freedom of speech, the right to offend. Now, it has been talked about, I've been listening to Twitter spaces where people are discussing the right to offend, that someone has a right to offend but someone does not have a right not to be offended and the only remedy for someone who, are, who actually has been offended is to protest peacefully protest that someone will come here and look at you and say you have a big head you have a funny nose you are, you look funny you need to go to the gym and the only remedy you have as someone who has been abused as someone who has been offended is to protest peacefully. Get a poster, you put it up or a chat and show people that I'm not happy that someone has abused me that I have a big head. <laughs> now, furthermore, I was looking at uh, how it was expounded on, and there was an incident that happened in France where, uh, but particularly at first when you read about the right to, to offend, you'll see that it is supposed to be based on someone's idea not someone's body or how they look like. That if I say something that you do not agree with, you, you have a right to go against it or you have a right to offend me basing on the idea that I've put forward. But now people are going to another level of abusing people about their bodies and how they look like. Now, it was, it was, it, there was a situation in France where a Muslim was abused about his religion. And from the fact that he was abused about his religion by a Christian, he went ahead and killed three Muslims. And the president of France said that he had a right of speech to, to, to offend the Muslims. Therefore, he had a right to offend. Then the president of, uh, of Turkey, Ondogan, came out and said, it wasn't right, and his remedy was to kill, and for him he was justifying it. So now you realize that the person who has, who has been offended, when, when you read further, his only remedy is to peacefully demonstrate, according to the people, the lawyers and the judicial officers that were trying to find a remedy to that. But my question is, in our laws here in Uganda, as regards to the right to offend, as we have been discussing it and people talking about it, what, where is the balance to the person who has been offended and the offender? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Lilian Chichoncho Kamahoro, a first year student offering law. Um, is the right to freedom of expression in Uganda Christian University there? Yes, it's there. We have several clubs like the Launchpad, Debate, and other clubs where we are given platform to expressly declare our grievances. We discuss and get solutions, but honestly, it stops there. I don't know if it reaches the major people in the administration or if it doesn't reach you, but probably if it reaches you, then you're not prioritizing our problems. I think you're assuming that just because people are not complaining of maybe not eating in the dining, everything is okay. But as students, the major problem should be about books and marks. Honestly, in Uganda Christian University, the problem I've seen, me as me, I'm not complaining, I'm very comfortable, but the problem of missing marks, personally, I'm, I'm really facing it. And you people may prioritize maybe the core, uh, the core course units, but also Can the- Can we listen to each other? But also the foundations are very necessary because it also increases on our C CGPA. Me as Lillian, I'm missing marks for introducing Bible. It was group work. Yeah, it was group work last semester. I remember I literally did most of the work. But to my surprise, it's me without Max. I've tried to reach the lecturer, but they told us she was transferred to somewhere else. I call, call, she doesn't pick up. I inbox her, she blue ticks me, like she sees the message and doesn't respond. So I know you are very busy people and we respect that. So that's why I think the student leaders, the leaders that we have, should actually give us a hand. They can ably reach you and inform you. Honestly, I'm not going to get a retake, yet I knew I sat down and did my work. I'm not going to accept that. It has been frustrating me. I've been depressed, my friends. My friends know very well. I've prayed, I've fasted, I still check Alpha and there's nothing. So honestly, me as Lillian, I really need a solution. I need those marks. Thank you very much. You are talking, we are listening. And Lillian says she will not accept that. All right, you have the final say at this. Thank you very much. My name is Nelson Oyet Ojok. Uh, most of my colleagues know me as the son of yet. I'm a third year old student and the deputy minister for justice and constitutional affairs in the Yale government. Well, allow me to start with, I always tell my colleagues that the problem our country is facing in terms of ex freedom of expression and assembly is because we have failed to understand that we are, we are in an accident. And I always refer to people that always read the history of Somalia. Somalia was one of the greatest nations Africa ever had. If it, if, it was, if it was not until 1991, when the useless President Barry Mohammed destroyed the country and destroyed everything. Now, what am I trying to say? I am trying to express a point that let us stop having people in positions and exhibit high levels of arrogance towards people who point fingers at them. Because honestly speaking, I would imagine me telling a fellow colleague, oh, let, let me say him, that you know what, you are very ugly. Therefore, he goes out and he pitches me and says, because you have insulted me in my capacity, since I have the authority as the speaker of the law, the law council, I sh you should therefore what? Leave administration. Two, I, I, really, I really want to know why. I, I really want to, to put the media to, to, to task that freedom of expression should not only be targeted for political oriented people. Okay? Freedom of expression concerns everybody. Because at the end of the day, this is what the Somalis were doing. When Barry was in power, he suppressed everything. And because he created a, a class system just like we have right now, whereby the whole focus, their main focus is to keep him in power. The day he left power is the reason, is the day Somalia has faced problems for the last 31 years. I pray that this lovely country of ours that has got a good number of elites who unfortunately have become, how do I describe it? Illiterate instead. You know, people who went to school and they're illiterate in administration, okay? They have failed to understand. Just, just look at this issue of, uh, of uh, Mr. Malema Biruzi and second. That level of arrogance here just exhibits. 
Okay? Because he feels he's entitled. How do you sentence someone for, for saying something wrong against you for eight to 18 months? Do you know how much 18 months can do to somebody's life? But because you feel you are entitled, you protect state interest, therefore you can do anything. You, you chase colleagues, I pity my members of parliament who are busy. Instead of busy pending their signatures to sanction the minister against torture, they are busy pending their signatures to sanction their own colleague because he attacked a fellow colleague. Please, this country has a lot to do. It's good that such, such opportunities come. I request that at one point we come and speak for our nation because if we don't do anything as soon as possible, we are going to have an accident that never chews, and that's where Somalia is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we give another round of applause to everyone who has come here, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you for being brave enough to speak truth to power. That is very important. I'm just going to give an opportunity to my panelists to wrap it up. I'll give the dean five minutes. I'll give the rest to two minutes because it's already one o'clock and I promised you that I'll end this conversation at one. Dean, you had it. I just want to hear from you. Um, thank you very much, uh, moderator. I am going to sum up what has been said. Um, someone mentioned parenting, which I agree with. Um, we all have different backgrounds and were brought up in a certain way and perhaps the way we behave portrays this. For the two years I've been dean, almost two years, I have seen things I can't recite. <laughs> Some of your parents want to kill you in my office. And I'm like, why don't you take this kid home and kill them from there? Hmm? You want to make me a witness to police, hmm? police interrogation. Hmm? And this thing, some of you, your people can't deal with you and they think the dean can deal with you. I think that is expecting a lot. But as um, Mr. Mwine said, uh, this all starts with us. You want to be listened to, also be a good listener. You want to have justice, also come to the altar of justice with clean hands. Mm? The dean is not a magician. Mm? Lack of responses, I for one and my team. Mm? Once someone expresses themselves, of course they expect a response. So me and my team, we try to address this one. And I think also at times, when you're expressing yourselves, someone mentioned um, studying the mood. Is it studying the mood? At times, it's also good to know the character of the person you're interacting with. For instance, if I became dean, I would enter the faculty and I know the dean is not around, depending on how people are behaving. Or if I would find the, the faculty quiet, hmm, I would ask the dean's secretary, is the dean in? And they say, yes, what is the mood? Ha, don't bother, I run away. But you're told the dean is in a mood for combat, you say, yes, I want to see him at this time. Hmm? Definitely there could be combat, hmm? motor combat at that. Hmm? So Ketra mentioned something about lack of response. Hmm? For instance, if you've been here, Ketra, you've been here three years. I believe you know which lecturers and administrators are always on Twitter and WhatsApp. And I think you also know those who you send a WhatsApp and know that they are malicious, but they'll read after a month. They are not social media people. Some colleagues don't even know hashtags. Mm? So if you say mm, hashtag being listened to, when the man has a cartoch phone, he's not on social media, you're wasting your efforts. Mm? So I think you also study someone's character and the way things are done. Then you know this one, I will tweet. This one, I will go through a class rep. This one, I'll go through the registrar. But even some of you can opt for more unconventional means like ambushing the dean as he goes to the parking or is leaving the parking. I don't chase away people, I listen. But people should definitely be listened to. Um, most of the things that have been mentioned, um, I would deem them to be bedroom matters which I will not recite before our panelists here. 
Mm. But I've taken note. Mm. I have taken note. Mm. And I'm the only one who can respond to that. But things to do with results generally are handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Some I found pre-existing, but it is still my duty to handle and they will be handled. That one I've given an assurance. Provided you have clean hands. Hmm? If it is a 2020 exam and you want to hand it in now, sincerely speaking, you're expecting a lot, which may not be granted. But we are here to solve your issues and they'll be handled. About an assembly, it is not a bad idea. How frequent? I am not sure. But I think even this assembly should be a forum for people to express themselves and also get results. Because at times, if you want to attack people and you don't get results, probably that's an action in vain. But this one we are going to look into. But with time, we are planning to have more interactive ways of uh, reaching out to students. Previously, we've been dealing with class representatives. And despite what you may think, some of them are really aggressive. And we have no option but to handle your complaints. Um, involvement in decision making. This one also has limitations. Some of you are here doing law, not that you chose, but because your parents. You may not have had a decision in that. But this is one of the tenets of good governance, involvement in decision making. We meet with class representatives. The guild president is a member of the university senate. That is the apex body that deals with student results. The guild president, the UCLS president, have unlimited access to my office. So this one will, will try to improve there, but definitely not all decisions. Even when it comes to my staff at the faculty, certain things, I have to take a decision as a leader. So this one can't be 100%, but definitely there could be room for, for improvement. But uh, generally, generally speaking, at least people are talking. Yes. As Solomon said, people are talking. And uh, there's a gentleman, I think he said he's a student leader, the one who talked about assembly. Is he? Yeah. He's? For the law society? Yes. The new one? Yes. Why hasn't he come to my office yet? <laughs> hmm? Hmm? Oh, oh, he wants me to go to his office first. Hmm? Yes. <laughs> I am on my way. Hmm? <laughs> hmm? But now going forward, we are going to be interacting on a regular. My office is uh, always open. But at least the positive thing is that uh, people are talking. And uh, we've tried in this public lecture to give you both sides of the coin. What are the rights and what are the limitations? And should you abuse these rights, what could be? But even as lawyers, one of the most important attributes you should have is, um, one is decorum. Even in the face of a challenge, how should you act? You're in court, there is fire in the court, the judge is acting strange. If you lose your cool as a client, then what will the client, what will the, I mean the lawyer, what will the client do? Law is about solving challenges. And freedom of expression could be, could be one of those. You could be agitated with actions of a judge. What do you do? Hull insults? And even it's about knowing what to do in the right forum. You have a right to express yourself, but should you say combat the vice chancellor at uh, community worship? Mm? What are your chances of survival? Mm? But if you followed him to his office and said I have an issue, probably you'll get, you'll get audience. A lecturer is teaching. Maybe you don't agree with what they are teaching. How do you go about that to express your discontent? And some of you have come up to me in confidence and said, eh, today we've studied, but I think uh, mm, the person concerned has supplied air. Mm? Mm? So now it's up to me as the dean to go and, but you've expressed yourself and Expression has end results. You don't express, express yourself as a ritual, assemble as a ritual, and that is the end of the story. Definitely you expect some changes, and you expect these changes to be for the better. 
And in UCU, we've prided ourselves. Even some of you have seen your parents being interviewed when you're being brought here. One of the reasons you're being brought here because it is a generally calm environment. But if you see the dean leading strikes, it means even you, you'll be in order to, to start rioting and doing the rest. But that is definitely not in order. So, Mr. Seranja, I think that will be it from me. But still, one of the tenets of freedom of expression is always providing means of redressing grievances. As human beings, people are always, even me, you may think I arrived, but I have my grievances. And I have a way of putting them across to those concerned. And some of you even wonder if I have problems. If I lent you my problems, you won't even go past the gate with them. You return back to sender. So thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, back to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mutesa is there. But I think for me the take home from him is that these conversations are going to start happening. You know, the students and the leadership of the school to listen to you and they talk back and you talk back and find solutions to some of your challenges. Right? Right? Dean, do you pledge that these things are going to happen? Because now I'm putting you on the spot. And, and, and should there be a mechanism that these conversations, like the action point from this lecture, public lecture on freedom of expression, should be setting up spaces where the students can you know, talk to you and you talk back to them. I think that's what you just promised us. I don't know why these students are looking at me like they're watching a horror. Hmm? <laughs> oh, I'm uh, basically playing fear factor. But hmm, those who have dealt with me will attest, my office is always open. If you find me there, you'll be attended to. And obviously, we have a hierarchy. If you deal with an administrator and you're not assisted, why should you go away lamenting? Go higher. There is a head of department. There is an associate dean. There is a registrar. There is a dean. So really, there is a cocktail of options. But please do not die in. They say if you fail to explode, you'll implode. So we do not want you to, to implode. If your problems are within our reach, you'll definitely be assisted. All right. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mutesasida, thank you for speaking to us. <laughs> Dr. Livingstone, you are also another person who was in the eye of the storm this afternoon. Thank you once again, Solomon. You see you. <laughs> and freedom of expression. First, I want to congratulate you upon expressing yourselves. I think that's a big achievement. We should actually clap for ourselves. Because at least the dean knows what hurts us. And also kudos to the dean and the faculty for convening a forum where you could be heard. Why not? That would be my starting The challenges that you are facing here, in my view, are not restricted to UCU. Actually, I have had the benefit of speaking at various fora in various universities, not only here in Uganda, but abroad. And I have found that the challenges more or less are the same. Students just want to be hard. And unfortunately, the leadership in most of the universities has grown in a way that it is so hierarchical to the extent that it is rare for that interaction to take place. Most of the challenges you are raising in my view are not actually for that team. 
the challenges are for this university administration here. I have been to this university several times. I have had this, this complaint about missing marks so many times, retake so many times, not only here but everywhere. I think it is high time this issue is addressed head on. <laughs> Mr. Dean, just go back. It's not only law faculty. I want to tell you, every university I go to, this seems to be a big problem. Why do students riot in Makerere? Why are they rioting? Why are students rioting in Chambogu? Why are students virtually everywhere in every university just because we are not providing a forum for responses? So one thing we can do, I believe, is to convey this message to the university administration that there is a need to create a, f a platform where there should be regular and continuous engagement so that the students are heard. The leadership also needs to be heard. You see, the right to be heard is a two-way. You can make a complaint, but also you have a right to listen to the feedback. You have a complaint and a feedback mechanism, and that should be cultivated. Not only in institutions of higher learning, everywhere. I told you, like, uh, early now, I told you in my presentation, the hierarchical nature of our society is creating a lot of discomfort, starting right from the family. If I were to sample a number of families amongst you, you will find very many who cannot be heard by their own parents have had to struggle to be what they are just because their parents cannot listen. Go to the places. There is hardly a mechanism to be heard. Go to the national leadership. There is hardly a framework to be heard. Most of these institutions tend to be ritual. They are ritualistic. And we have been urging the powers that be, that we need to create and nurture a democratic and human rights culture. It is the source of the problem. We don't have that culture. Since when are you supposed to question your teacher? When did you start questioning your parent? When did you start questioning your employer? When did you start questioning the president? This is a problem. And even some of us are victims of that. Who wants to be questioned? Rarely. All of us, human, humanly, we just want to be praised. If you were to praise the dean here, I'm sure he would be the happiest man this weekend. <laughs> but I want to tell you, human nature is such that we all want praises. We don't want criticism. But we have to create and cultivate a culture which allows criticism and constructive Criticism. And that is important at every level. You go to an LOC meeting, you will be shocked. When the LOC speaks, no one has to answer. When your church priest speaks, let me talk about the church. We all go to different eh, places. When did you ever question your priest? You tell me. When did you last question your priest? Tell me. Can you question the bishop? Can you question your uh, parish chief, your parish pr uh, priest? No one. It is a culture that is lacking. We still need to nurture it, develop it, so that we create an environment which is harmonious and it can allow for open engagement. Mr. Dean, I hope you agree. It is the problem. The problem is that big. I have been on many boats and you try to, you know, pass the colleagues to say, why don't we hear the other side? And they say, we, it's final. It's done. That matter has been solved. The law says this. Our guidelines are clear. The policy here is this. It is done. They don't want to think and, you know, listen to other people. That's a problem. But perhaps you see you can set the pace. After all, 
your Christian university. Added you. Christian, what does Christian mean? Maybe we need to interrogate the issue of Christianity. Was Christianity really de democratic? Christ is Christianity democratic? I don't know. Maybe you need to revisit the name of the university. But I don't want to take you that far. It is called the prestigious Uganda Christian University. And it is all well known. Now, social media. Friends, and frankly, I love social media. I love social media with all its imperfections. Because it gives me information which I would not get. While my brothers here are struggling to censor themselves, somewhere, somewhere on the local school is already sending me information. But am I such a fool that I cannot analyze this information and figure out what is right and what is wrong? I think that is what is required. Social media should be responsive. Social media should be used in a manner that allows us to grow eh, and promote information. But we should not, for its imperfections, undermine social media because it has helped us to overcome so many barriers. I think you agree. It has helped us to uh, overcome that. But should it be misused? No one, no one likes to be abused. Who wants to be abused? So when you, are, when you abuse others, they protest. You come back and you say, you know what? I am being mistreated but didn't mistreat the other party. So it is that delicate balancing that we are all urging. I think one of the, uh, the speakers made reference to an issue of impunity, where, say, there's a category of people in the country who think they own the country, they do as they wish. The truth is, there is impunity in this country. There is a growing culture of impunity. There are people who are untouchable. There are people who would kill if you only said something. There are people who do things that cannot be held accountable. And we are all held hostage. That's the truth. There is so much growing inequality in the, in the society. There is so much abuse. People are so distressed. The levels of disbordance are growing and you certainly ask yourself, what should we do? We need to address this issue of impunity. Question is how? Ben, you will help me answer. How do we deal with the issue of impunity? It's impunity which is eating us up. People are told the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. Instead, they retaliate. They kill at leisure. They oppress at leisure. They mistreat at leisure. They discriminate at leisure. They mistreat others at leisure. And no one touches them. And everyone knows them. No wonder Ben is struggling with this problem, whether he's a Munyankolo or not. But Munyankolo are my friends. But if a Munyankolo is misbehaving, he should be held accountable. Isn't it? If a Muganda is misbehaving, he should be held accountable. Everyone should not, no one should be above the law. But there are people who are above the law and no one seems to touch them. And that group is not only growing, but has, is becoming a real challenge to this country. The, the poverty we are facing, the unemployment we are facing, the corruption we are facing, the challenges you are having, can't be all addressed because of that growing culture of impunity. I, I don't have an answer. The only thing I can say is to speak out, document it, and call for those who are in positions of responsibility to take responsibility and be accountable for their actions. Then uh, the whole question of um, offending and right not to be offended and to protest. Of course, everyone has the right to, to protest. If I'm being mistreated, I should protest. Why not? I should protest. But how do I protest? There must be constructive ways. There must be objective ways. They are, cannot begin by throwing stones. You need to have a very civilized approach to dealing with the problem. So, again, it is about balancing. You see, the right to freedom of expression 
association and assembly. By the way, they are cousins. Those three rights are cousins. You can't talk about one and leave out the other. Assembly, association, and expression, they are cousins. Now, those three, number one, they are highly contested rights. Highly contested. When I go to many countries to profile their performance, to benchmark them, what I always face is that problem of balancing. You know, you find the leaders are pointing you to the whole question of the legal regime, the fact that the society has become, you know, impudent, that people no longer care about other people, and then you ask them, what about you? What are you doing? To address that? And you hardly see that. So, this question of balancing, creating that delicate balance is our biggest problem. We all treasure it. We all want those rights. We are all entitled to them. We want them. But the problem is, as you enjoy the, each of those rights, must, you must bear in mind that there is a way it impacts on other people. And depending on where you are at a particular time in, in, at the moment, you need to determine exactly how best to enjoy that right without undermining the integrity and dignity of other people. Because freedom of expression has a lot to do with reputation. It has a lot to do with integrity, dignity of people. Many times when we are trying to enjoy that right, many times we enjoy that right, at the expense of other people. So you need to bear that in mind. But above it all, freedom goes with responsibility. Whether you like it or not. And always never give up. Be persistent in whatever you want. If it's the right thing, be persistent until you, you actually get the solution. Having said all that, the bottom line is constructive engagement. Let's con continue to listen to each other. Let's create platforms for feedback and at all times ensure that there is harmony. There is harmony between the leadership and the student community, the employer and the employee, the parish priest and the faithful, the government and its people. When that is done, then you are likely to enjoy these rights without unnecessary restrictions. But all in all, I want to commend you for having expressed yourself and I hope you'll take it a step further. I thank you. Dr. Livingston Sewanyana, always passionate about this, but I saw a person who had given up on the fight against impunity. I saw that. What do we do, you know? Um, Ben, you were asked to answer that question. You're welcome. Um, I, I'm more than glad to answer that question. What can you do about impunity? Nothing. Um, because if a person is going to be like that, they're going to be like that. Your options are to do kakwenza and get tortured and die. You can go and protest. You can try and be the change that you want to be. I was finished where I started. We are at Uganda Christian University. We've got to believe that there is a bigger power that is able to make sure that there is justice. You must believe that there is a God of justice. And so I would say, above everything else, you want to pray and do your part where you can. And I'll start just two or three things that I want to share. And um, for me, which is why. Every time I am asked to be at UCU or at Makere or anywhere where there are people that are 25 years or younger, I will drop everything I am doing and come. When Andrew called me, I was supposed to be having two training sessions today that are very important. I, they said, you must be there. I said, no, I'm going to be at UCU. You do what you need to do. I'm being a rebel for today. Because for me, the solution to all the problems that we're talking about here lie with your children. Not even you. You guys are already wasted. You have your minds formed. You are rebellious already. You, you are stubborn. You are... Am I wrong? Yeah. You guys are wasted. Our generation is even worse. It's why the country is in the mess it is in. 
The hope for Uganda, the hope for this country is in your children. My children, yes, maybe because they are still very young, but mostly your children who are still in your loins. And here's why I say this. To change a nation takes generations. And it's going to have to be you guys to take that responsibility and do something about it by teaching your children to be better than you have been. My dad was a typical Munyankole man. If you walked into the house, we all ran away. He was, and I'm sure everyone who is here will tell you exactly the same thing. When our dads walked into the house, whoosh, this nonsense when we were coming to stand on the microphone to talk to the dean, hi! By the time afternoon ends, eh, you'll be summoned with suspension letters. It's how we grew up. And that's why you hear Solomon and Dr. Sanyana saying, we commend you for being able to speak out. But that speaking out should not be abused because you've been given a right to speak. It should still come with that respect, which for us came out of fear. But for you should come out of a place of knowledge and information. And so I would say, think about what you can do to make things better. I'll finish with, I started with the Bible, I'll finish with the Bible. Jesus said, if a guy hits you on one cheek, what do you do? Aha, uh -huh. hey, <laughs> let me explain and qualify myself and listen to me very, very carefully, okay? There is a certain sense of pride and I would say arrogance and I would even add the word impunity that comes from an individual level when we feel aggrieved. You ha Solomon has abused me for the sleeve, right? The natural feeding and response is like someone was saying, I've been offended, let me hold the placard, right? The natural response is, I've been offended, I will abuse you back, right? It doesn't work. I'll give you my personal experience. For the longest time, because of my profile and having spent 20 years in the media, people say things about you. People will call you a con man, people will call you a thief, I've been called a rapist at some point in my life by a girl who it turned out was just unhappy that I had rejected her. So she went and made up a story about how Ben Mwine is a rapist. Some of these stories will make their way to newspapers, to gossip columns. Now I can come out and just protest and respond and go on social media and say, you idiots, who do you think you knew? Will that help me? And so I when Jesus says, when they slap this cheek, you turn the other one. He wasn't stupid in saying that. One of my biggest mantras is this. Find the peace at your level. It doesn't matter what you say to me or about me. I will look at you and smile and say, okay. I don't have road rage anymore. Your border border is cutting. I get knocked by border borders like anyone who drives. Every day they scratch their car. You have worked hard, you have saved for eight years, you've taken a loan, you've bought a nice car. The worst one was when I had just repainted my car small. I have a car small, nice blue Lancer, which I love. I love cars. I love that car. Went and got money, one point something million shillings, gave it to a mechanic, had him repaint it. Picked it from the garage. Three minutes from Shibuli, I was reaching Mukwano. Boda boda guy. <laughs> what do you do? Natural response is, get out, swear obscenities at the guy. Do you understand how much money I spent? You buffoon what? Will that change anything? I looked at the guy with all the pain in my heart. I told the guy, it's okay, you go. He wouldn't believe it. But guess what? The guy is okay. Has this, I've never fixed it up to now. If you, if you ever see it, it still has a huge scratch on the front fender. Is it ideal? No. Has it affected my life in ways that affect the GDP? No. I'm able to sleep in peace. And while that applies to a small Mitsubishi, it applies 
to much, much bigger things. Where if you learn how to control yourself and not act because you're being, feeling deprived of justice or, or whatever, it will solve you so many problems. Brings me to the next thing about playing by the rules. The world that we are in, I hate to break it to you guys, is not going to get better. The rules you're living under, if you want to call them dictatorship or whatever, some people say Uganda is a dictatorship, some people say it's a democracy, depending on who you listen to. It's not going to get better. America is the biggest democracy in the world. And yet in January 2021, they climbed onto the Capitol Hill and almost burnt it down. Hmm? Why? Oh, we are aggrieved. We are, oh, no, we must fight. Guys, the way the world is set up is that you will never beat the system. You can fight it. It's going to be a problem. So here's what I say you do. Do your part. Speak out for what is right. But learn to play by the rules. If you hear maybe easy, and you know, he mentioned it. You can't go before a judge and say certain things. You know. When they send you to 18 months in jail, you have no right to complain because it has been done within the rule book which you signed up to when you entered that system. Do I make any sense? When you come to UCU, there's a circular that says this is our fees structure. Your parent has the choice to either bring you to UCU or accept their level and understand that you know what? I can't afford you. I love Range Rovers. I can't afford one. I can't be going around complaining, ah, why am I not driving a Range Rover? These are some very hard truths where you must understand that, you know what? Like I said, find the peace where? Find the peace at your level. My mother wrote to me a letter when I was in my S3 that changed my life. Many of my friends, I went to Mbarara High School, so we had a lot of people who are children of the system now as it is, and they were getting a lot of money for us pocket money, me, our things were tight. And I wrote to my mom complaining that I wasn't getting enough pocket money. My mother wrote to me and explained to me the sacrifices my father has to go through to pay school fees every time. And the fact that I have school fees should be enough for me to be grateful. When we started, he was encouraging us to learn to be grateful. I still have that letter. My mother abused me. She abused me in Runyankole. She abused me in English. This is in writing, meanwhile. Four-page letter with abuses in Runyankole in English. <laughs> you people, being abused in vernacular is very dangerous. It sticks. <laughs> but guess what? She was right. As being an entitled brat and unaware of my circumstances and unable to appreciate what I had. So, that being said, I'll finish with one last story. I used to be a guy who would fight everything. Over the last 15 years, I've had maybe four or five court cases, the majority of which I was the plaintiff. I've sued the state. I've been sued by the state. I was once accused of trying to murder the president because of an accident I had just behind here in Mukono, actually, as you enter the town. Uh, I eventually got acquitted because I was innocent. But I had that thing of, in me of, Sha, how? How dare you? You do something to me, I sue you. I'd been watching too many American TV shows. In the US, everyone sues everyone. You guys are lawyers, you will understand. In you, our justice system doesn't work like that. And I learned the hard way. The average length of a court case in Uganda is about six years. <laughs> Correct? Yeah? I won almost all of these cases, one of which, by the way, was against a university which had refused to give me my marks. <laughs> that might sound familiar. And it was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made trying to take on this university. I eventually won the case. But it was a big mistake. It drained me emotionally. It drained me physically. It drained me financially. It drained me in every single sense of the word. Because I felt there had been an injustice. How do you tell me I have a retake from a paper I did and I know I passed? Right? And I fought it and I fought it. And I, 
And I won. But I wish I hadn't. I wish I had just gone and done that retake. I would have been a much more peaceful person. Because it took seven years. Seven. So you can be here fighting over missing marks. You will fight with the dean. You will fight. You will fight. You will fight. And in four years' time, you'll be here. You haven't graduated because you're fighting. So it might not be a popular thing you want to hear. And I know that there are systems that are systemic that the dean needs to fix. I don't understand how marks go missing. If you have evidence and it's very clear, they should be able to address that. If there isn't, obviously it's a system problem that might be bigger than everyone, including the dean. Guess what? It might be a bit more work. It might take away another three, four months from you. But it's better than going through my experience where you spend seven years in court. I want, I, biggest mistake I ever made. I wish I had done that retake. And the bottom line is this as I finish. You're within a system. That system is bigger than you. And while you have the right to express yourself, and you should express yourself, learn how to be wise, to work within the system, above all else, find a peace at your level. It will save you so many problems. So I submit. Win me, <laughs> Ben. ben. Ben Mwine there speaking to some of the issues. I agree with you with some, others I don't. But it's okay, it's, it's the diversity in opinion. <laughs> Chemtai, you have the final say. Um, thank you so much. I feel so challenged. The elders have spoken everything. Um, I just want to applaud the students for standing up to the administration <laughs> and speaking their views out. Clap for yourselves. It's not every day that you, you know, come out and speak about what's hurting you in there. As you said, if you do not explode, you implode. Yeah. So I would just like to address the police question. <laughs> the police in Uganda, who hasn't interfaced with them? Mr. Serwan, I think you, you've been there before. They raided your home at some point. <laughs> I think I was still young, but yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> so the police should be the enforcers of human rights. But guess what? They're the ones that are violating these rights the most. And I think it starts from the system still. When you look at the people that are recruited into the police, P7 leavers, senior four leavers, the lucky ones, the cadets, cadet officers, maybe senior six. And these people, I don't know if they really take them through training about human rights and enforcement. I highly doubt that. Because it just shows from how they handle the citizens. Someone will beat you. That's, do they know that there is uh, a convention you know, against torture? They do not know that because who has told them? They have no idea. So they will just continue enforcing the law the way they know it. Beat them, beat them to save their lives, kill them to save their lives, which is not right. So if we want to solve this, we should go back and look at the people we recruit into the police force. The police should be the most respected force or maybe respected entity and most trusted to enforce human rights but are doing the contrary. Let's go back, recruit people that are sensible enough, people that can be educated on human rights, conduct trainings, trainings and trainings and give them facilities. You know, recruit people can read. Some police officers do not even read. I've gone to police stations in places like Hoima, you find this gentleman seated there at the, at the desk, but he can't even write. And those are the police officers that you're entrusting with your human rights. They cannot protect them because they do not even know what those are. For them, there's still this, you know, order nimoja back in the day. We say it, I mean, order from above, we're going to beat you guys if you do not do this. Yeah, because we've had issues. Most of the cases in, uh, about the right to assembly are about police. Mwanga Chivumbi, 
section, Z30 of the Police Act, it was scrapped off. They brought, back, they brought it back in the name of the Public Order Management Act. Cheborion said, Justice, you know, he complained about how Parliament could go ahead and sign this law into power, a law that has all or most of the provisions that were declared unconstitutional in the case of Mwanga Chivumbi versus Attorney General. Who are we complaining about? It's the police. So where did we go wrong? I mean, I don't think they even read these decisions that the court makes. They do not even know that they're a big issue, you know? So my recommendation would be they should do something about the police, educate them about human rights, conduct trainings. I mean, if you can have resources to squander around in other things that are unproductive, you can definitely have resources to recruit sensible police officers and train them on human rights and law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. Shemtai, thank you very much for speaking to us. Can you clap for my panelists? May I say this before I can uh, invite Nicole to come, to come and close, uh, close this event. I come from this space. I come from a space of raising concerns in a diplomatic way. If my diplomacy fails, I am naturally an aggressive person. I go aggressive, but also it gives me an opportunity to push you to the negotiating table. When you're a weak person, you don't get to negotiate. You have to put someone in a state of negotiation. And that doesn't come easy. I'm a person who demands my right that if you refuse to give it to me, I will push you and then get you to sit to negotiate. If you have decoded the message, please decode it. Good afternoon. May I invite Nicole to come and give her closing remarks. Nicole from the American Bar Association. May I also say, can we give her some love? May I also say that the African Institute for Investigative Journalism is really, really happy to be partnering with the American Bar Association to advance freedom of expression. So Nicole, thank you for supporting the Institute. We are grateful. Right? I'll clap for you again. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to follow on all of these um, eloquent speakers, really. I want to um, congratulate all of you for a very, very stimulating um, discussion. So I want just a round of applause for everyone. <laughs> Um, and also just to say that um, as I was listening to, to everyone speaking, I was realizing what a pleasure it is to actually uh, be here in person and to listen to everyone. It's been two years, uh, very difficult years of um, COVID, uh, closed schools, universities closed. This project um, that we're running uh, that's been going on for the past two years, it actually launched right around the time COVID broke out. Um, and so we had actually intended to have these type of discussions um, throughout this uh, period. We've not been able to do it in this way. Um, it's only just, we're just coming back now to that. And it's been uh, a real pleasure to, to hear all of you. And it, um, it highlights the importance of assembling, getting together, and exchanging views, different views, hearing uh, from the students, from the panelists, um, so yes, we're, we're really pleased um, to, to have been able to be part of this and to, to see this actually come to, to fruition. Um, maybe just to say a couple of words, again, this has been a stimulating uh, discussion on freedom of expression. Um, there's been so much that's been said, so I'm not going to even try and summarize, but just to say that um, this, is, this is part of a series of lectures that we've been supporting. Um, through a project that we've been running, like I said, for the past two years, promoting freedom of expression. Uh, we've been working closely with a number of partners, um, the East African uh, Network of un um, University-Based Clinics, uh, UNILAC, um, but also 
The lectures have been uh, co-organized with a number of universities around the country, both Uganda but also Tanzania. Um, so this is um, just briefly, this is a project that uh, um, has been uh, focused on freedom of expression and using different means, so strategic litigation, advocacy, capacity building. Um, we've been working with uh, partners in both Uganda and Tanzania, the Network of Public Interest Lawyers, the East African Network of University Clinics, um, then we have the um, Tanzania Human Rights Defenders Coalition, um, MISATAN, uh, is a media rights organization, so it's been a, it's been a it's been a very very interesting uh, past two years, um, given all the things that have gone on, uh, both in uh, in Uganda and Tanzania, and uh, and just to say that we we really value the relationship with the universities, um, Uganda um, UCU. Um, Macquarie University. We're going to be going to Gulu probably next time around. Um, but yes, it's been, it's been really a wonderful uh, collaboration that we've had, and just to thank um, the university for the, the excellent collaboration, um, the warm welcome, and, uh, and we do look forward to having um, other engagements with you going forward. Also to say that um, it's, uh, it's, I'm happy to see that um, so many students have shown up. There's been a lot of uh, freedom of expression, a lot of views expressed here. And um, I think we, we, we exceeded um, our expectations in that this was a um, discussion meant to, to promote this um, discussion around um, the situation in the country, whether we're moving forward or backward. There's been a lot of views in different ways, but we didn't expect that it would also be an, a forum for the students to, to express themselves and to, and to be a bit of assembly um, on its own. And, uh, and as was said um, by some of the other panelists, I would just echo that, that view that, um, that we do hope that this conversation will continue um, and that we hope that this, that this discussion has been a platform and an opportunity for you to start that discussion, a constructive discussion as was said before, um, and hopefully that you'll be able to resolve the issues um, that you've raised um, today. So I think just in closing, we've gone for quite a while, um, but just in closing, again, to, to thank um, a special appreciation for all the panelists for agreeing to come today to spend your morning um, here with the students. Um, it's been extremely engaging. You've triggered a lot of thoughts, lively debate um, and discussion, which, like we said, we hope you take this further outside this hall to your classrooms, outside the classroom. Um, and to the moderator, our excellent moderator, um, we're really, really um, pleased that you were able to accept this uh, invitation on a, on a short notice. Um, but also thankful that you were able to bring along the, the documentary and, and, and screen that for, for the students. It has not, I think, gone around um, as much, and so we wanted to take this opportunity to also um, share that with you. Um, so it's, uh, I think there, that, that's a whole other discussion, um, but just to say that, that, yeah, thank you very much for, for bringing that and sharing that with everyone. And then finally to the students, um, thank you for your participation, uh, for showing up, for, for spending your, your morning here with us. Um, we hope that the conversation and the discussion has been constructive, that you've, you're taking something away from, from this and that this will also contribute to improving conditions um, for you around the university. So thank you so much and um, yes, have a good rest of the day. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much for those remarks. May I allow my panel to, to leave as I make the last announcement? Um, there's a student who gave me this and says, please tell people that today night at Inkoyo Hall at 7.30, there's um, uh, Azania Poetry and Music Grand Show. It starts at 7.30 p.m. All right, thank you very much, everyone, for being part of this public lecture. Enjoy the rest of your viewing. viewing. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. <laughs> Have yourselves a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe before you go, <laughs> I was wondering why you're not leaving. Mm? Can you convey our gratitude? Do you see you being the best in the entire university? Okay. Dr. Ann, those who are
Um, <laughs> um, for those who are seated, you look to your left. Huh? Yes, so I was wondering where the love is coming from. Hmm? So please attend to that desk. It is all for you. And should you find it lovely and enjoyable, it is me and Nicole. Should you find it problematic, it is Andrew. <laughs> hmm? And uh, from uh, Dr. Sewanyana, he sends his congratulations to UCU as a university for being the best in the human rights competition in Gulu. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well done to our students. Um, I think this, oh. Mr. Lutaya, due to public demand, hmm? come and pray for the food. Hmm? I know there is food, I can guarantee, I don't know if I can guarantee that everyone will eat, but I know there, there, is, hmm? there is food. So please, you pass by that table. Where is Mr. Lutaya? Aha. Uh -huh. hmm? Thank you so much, Dean. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming once again. Uh, they told me the Guild President of uh, Victoria University is also here. Australia. Australia. Yes. Please, please. Please. Oh, you can stand up for recognition, please. Oh, She's a lady. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for our panelists that have been here, that have discussed for us. Father, we thank you for people attending. We thank you that the views that people have expressed are going to have a positive impact, Father. We thank you that this public lecture has not been for nothing. We've not wasted our time to come here, and we believe that the decisions are going to be implemented. Father, as we're going to have our lunch, bless us. Bless us on our way back. Bless our dean, fuck our tov law, bless the administrator so that they can always, you know, implement the decisions of the students or it's involved students in everything. Father, we thank our sponsors, we thank different partners that have attended the event. We want to thank you, Father, that you've been with us. We thank you for our family and friends. We thank you that you brought us and we thank you that others that are going to be going back, Father, they are going to reach well. And as we eat this lunch, Father, we pray that you always bless us. In the mighty name of the Lord, I believe and pray. Amen. Thank you. Please walk to the table, pick your pack, and a drink. They are afternoon lectures, remember. <laughs>